the very roots of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Welcome to Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. As always, we're sponsored by the People's Institute for Revolutionary Semiotics. Before we introduce today's guests, just wanted you to know we have a Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash M-U-H-H. Send us a buck a month. And today we are delighted to bring to you Graham Harmon, who is, you're now in California, correct? Teaching. Sorry. Where are you teaching now? Because you were at the university, the American University of Cairo for almost 16 years. years. Yeah. Right. Now you're now, teaching in California. At the Southern California Institute of Architecture, also known as SciArc for short. It's not well known outside the architectural world, but very well known inside the architectural world. Right. And change is interesting. Something I would love to hear. Well, maybe if you'd like, you can you can kind of tell us about that change and 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 how also the fact that Triple O, which you are known for and which you obviously helped to start, as has become well received in the architectural world. Do you want you want to tell us just a little bit about that? Because that's something that our viewers or listeners may not know about. Yeah, my first interaction that I can recall with architects was in 2007. I was doing a lot of lectures in London at the time because of the speculative realism circle. And I was invited to the AA, the Architectural Association in London, to give a lecture and sit on a jury for the first time. Tail Lawrence and Tanya Seams invited me there. And they're still at the AA. And uh, that was sort of a one-off at the time. And then in 2011... I was in New York to give a couple of weeks worth of lectures at various places. And my old undergraduate classmate, David Rue, who I I hadn't talked to for maybe 20 years, showed up for some of my lectures, gave me a ride back to the apartment I was renting in Washington Heights. And on the way back, he was saying, you know, your philosophy has a lot of potential for architecture. And I I was surprised by this, as Derrida was once surprised by the same thing in his case. And uh, that was really kind of when it started. I started then getting invited to more architecture schools. And one thing led to another. And in 2016, I started at SIARC, leaving the American University in Cairo after 16 years. And it's been a wonderful chance at my age to learn a completely new discipline from scratch. My first architecture book is coming out in June or July, Architecture and Objects from University of Minnesota Press. And it's an extension of my argument in Art and Objects, because Kant, who's really the central figure in modern aesthetics, either for or against, Kant's at the center of everything, Kant is pretty down on architecture. It can't be pure beauty because it's useful. Right. And so I am arguing against Kant's particular view of formalism there and trying to develop a more complex version of formalism that enables architecture to be at the center of aesthetic discourse, really, because it tackles problems that it has to tackle that visual art cannot tackle. So that's what my book is about. Now, that makes a lot of sense because in Art and Objects, which you kind of already lay out also in... uh, the book in 2017 for Penguin, Object-Oriented Ontology, A New Theory of Everything, you make the claim, which I hadn't expected, starting with tool being and on, that aesthetics is first philosophy. Now, right. you develop this for architecture as too, then, I assume, in, in your new book. Yes. And remember, of course, that in Triple O, Object-Oriented Ontology, aesthetics refers to the tension between an object and its own qualities. And right. there's, there are four different ways that can ha- that can happen because there are two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. So usually when you see a brief statement about triple O, people are going to say, we believe objects withdraw and you can't see them. Right. Hey, that's, that's what we take from Heidegger, but that's only one of four such aesthetic tensions in triple O. And this goes all the way back to Aristotle's discovery about substance, which is that a substance can have different qualities at different times. You can't define a substance because it's not made up of a bundle of qualities. He didn't say bundle, that's Hume, but he he was anticipating Hume a millennia in advance. And so uh, in my recent work, I've defined as literalism, the view that an object is nothing more than a bundle of qualities. So Hume is a great literalist. Right. A thing simply is its qualities. And so you should be able to define it in prose terms. Whereas the fact that an object has tension with its own qualities, it both has and doesn't have them, paradoxically. This is what Triple O is really about. And this is why aesthetics is so central for us. I find that 
that claim. And I, I do want to circle back around to your development, but I guess the the thing that struck me when reading this is, you know, from tool being and guerrilla metaphysics, you make clear that one of the obviously one of the important readers of Heidegger is Levina, and he makes the claim that ethics is first philosophy. Is there was there any I mean, when you make this claim that aesthetics is first philosophy, is there some sort of resonance there or some sort of um, any sort of connection there at all in your mind? Or is this just kind of a happy coincidence? Oh, no, I'm very involved in the works of Levinas, and I have been since my master's degree. And so I think I was trying to playfully counter what he says. The reason ethics is first philosophy for him is because he's interested in that which is other, that which is absolutely surprising. And that's his Heideggerian dimension, except transposed into an ethical register. There's something outside that we can't master with the totality that is infinite, and it somehow summons us and makes demands on us. But for Triple O, there are also aesthetic rifts within the sensual realm, which maybe some Levinas is better on those issues than people realize. People are so mm-hmm. obsessed with his ethics that they forget he's a great philosopher of jouissance. Mm-hmm. He talks specifically about how Heidegger is unable to thematize enjoyment because he's always looking at the reference of tools beyond themselves. Levinas talks about things as finalities. I simply enjoy, you're smoking a cigarette there. You're simply yeah. enjoy, enjoying the cigarette. It's not cigarette for the purpose of something. It's also a finality that you simply enjoy. And I don't know if there's been a good study on Levinas and Lacan comparing their different conceptions of jouissance, but it would be an interesting theme, I think. Right. <laughs> It's a good idea for an episode for us. Oh, yes. Yeah. (laughs) This is good because you mentioned your master's thesis, and this gets to the opening question I wanted to ask. But, you know, just to so tell us a little bit about your experience in education uh, as an undergrad or as, as a graduate student and what sort of, you know, made philosophy become your your passion, let's say. That goes back to when I was 16 years old. We had a set of encyclopedias at home. And I just, for some reason, I would often read the encyclopedia. I would pull out an article and, and just look at it. And that night, back in October 1984, I just remember thinking, huh, philosophy, I don't really know much about it. I'd made a couple of false starts with like philosophy afternoon or night classes extracurricularly, and it hadn't done a lot for me. One was with a college professor, one was with a high school teacher. It hadn't done a lot for me. But I, that one night, I just picked up the encyclopedia article, read it, and Thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is mm-hmm. this is who I am, and that started it. And so, like a lot of teenagers who get into philosophy, I started with Nietzsche. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I devoured all of Nietzsche's books. I think first, and then uh, by happy coincidence, for that Christmas for my 16th birthday, my parents, who are always been attentive parents with their children's wanderings intellectually and otherwise, and they gave me for Christmas History of Philosophy by Julian Marias, which you can mm. still it's the Dover. Right. Philosophy. And that was a happy stroke of good fortune because Marias was a disciple of Ortega y Gasset, Jose Ortega mm. Gasset. And I got clued into the whole tradition of Spanish 20th century philosophy there, which is a very powerful tradition. I think you have some involvement with it yourself, Taylor. And uh, so then from there, Ortega y Gasset, who's an absolutely fabulous writer, has kind of fallen out of fashion in the Anglophone world since existentialism fell out of fashion because he was kind of grouped in with that whole constellation. Mm-hmm. But he's really fantastic. He was once described to me by an undergraduate professor I knew as, as an intelligible Heidegger, and there's something to that. <laughs> Ortega's a better writing Heidegger in some ways. Mm-hmm. And so I learned a lot from him. As a freshman in college, I ran across Ortega's metaphor essay, which yes. is in the book Phenomenology and Art, and it stumped me and fascinated me in a way no other philosophical text has done since. And starting in, I guess that was 1987, I first read it, and I thought, this is different from the rest of his stuff. Mm-hmm. Somehow I can't really assimilate this. And it wasn't until writing Guerrilla Metaphysics in, I guess I wrote it in 2004, a year before it was published, Mm -hmm. maybe 2003, somewhere in there. And that was the first time that I forced myself to figure it out. And that is really, that that contains the seeds of all of the triple O's, not only theory of metaphor, but the theory of the fourfolds. So it's really, Ortega's metaphor essay is probably the most influential thing in my career that I ever read. And Levinas is also someone you have to throw into the mix. And that was largely due to Alfonso Lingus, who mm-hmm. was my favorite professor for the master's at Penn State. And uh, Lingus wasn't just a professor. He was he was kind of a scene. He was mm. such a character that students were welcome to hang out at his house, to show up unannounced pretty much any hour late at night. Uh, and you, wow. just, you and a friend would go over, ring his bell, and he'd be delighted to see you. Re- absolutely delighted. Because he his lifestyle was that he'd wake up super early in the morning to do his writing. So the rest of the day was free for any adventure that popped up. And for him, that included students dropping by. And since I was hanging out with Lingus, of course, I wanted to learn Levinas and Merleau-Ponty since mm-hmm. 
he had translated those things. And Levinas made an especially large impact on me. I ended up writing my master's paper on him. Oh, okay. And Lingus made some important critiques of my master's paper that really triggered the birth of object-oriented ontology. I was still too much of a Heideggerian then. This would have right, been 19, okay. I was 23. This was the summer of 91. And I was basically taking Heidegger's line on the tool system. I was saying there are no individual items of equipment. They're all dissolved into the tool system. And whenever you give Lingus a piece of work, you'd get a wonderful letter from him a month or two later from some crazy country that he was residing. I think I sent my master's paper to Posta Restante in Guatemala City, for example. Okay. Oh, wow. And I got a letter from the Philippines, maybe, or somewhere, criticizing my, my interpretation of Heidegger and saying... <laughs> He wondered if that's really true. And he was using Levinas to wonder if it's really true. That mm, mm-hmm. When I put on a shoe, the shoe isn't completely dissolved into its purpose. It feels too tight. So I like the shine of the shoe. And he ended up publishing this wonderful article called Levinas on Individual Substance or Levinas on Substance. Mm-hmm. It was buried in the Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, something nobody reads. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that really, that critical feedback from Lingus is what set me on the road to Triple O in the early 90s. That's wonderful. And so you studied under Langus at Penn State. Yes. Now for your PhD, was that at DePaul? Is that correct? Or PhD was at DePaul. Okay. And DePaul, Penn State had some toxic issues as it's had intermittently throughout the years, let's say. It's, they've, mm-hmm. they've had problems with about three separate groups of faculty members by now. I don't know what it's like today, but there have been you know lawsuits and stuff going into receivership, maybe. There's just been one crisis after another over the years, and there was something ugly about the, the culture there at the time. I ended up at DePaul, which was one of the places I considered right out of college. And DePaul had its own issues, but one nice thing about it was everybody was independent, and I was ready to be independent. There was minimal interference from the faculty, minimal hoops to jump through. They trusted you to go to the classes you want and to mm-hmm start working on a dissertation topic. Here's the other thing. My undergraduate education was at St. John's, which is okay. the, the ultra classical great books education. Right. And so we went from uh, Homer up through Freud and Husserl, and that was it. We did a couple more recent genetic papers in science, but there was really no contemporary philosophy whatsoever, unless you did it on your own. I ended up doing Heidegger on my own, and uh, I wanted more. And uh, DePaul was a great place for that because it was Heidegger and Derrida, largely. Gotcha. I've never been much of a Derrida fan, but right. it, it at least put me in contact with more contemporary trends, which I needed at that stage of my career. And so it was a, it was a good place to be. I wasn't a happy graduate student. A lot of that was my own fault. I'd procrastinate. I'd you know, take disagreements with professors too seriously, the mm. kinds, of, kinds of things that people do in their 20s too much. <laughs> yes. um, I could have had less drama there by my own volition mm-hmm. than there was, but it was really a, basically a good place. And Chicago was a great place in the nineties. I got to see Michael Jordan in his prime every night wow. on TV and Chicago is just a wonderful city yeah. and, uh, you know, increased my debt a lot, but it's, uh, it was a great place to study. I finished in, uh, sp- spring of 99 mm-hmm. after eight years at DePaul too long. Don't take that long to finish your <laughs> dissertation. Don't, don't be a procrastinator. Just move along. I was a right. procrastinator. In the meantime, I had a job as a sports writer, and that really helped me both in terms of quantity of production as a writer and Mm -hmm. engaging in this as a writer. I was already a decent writer, but being a sports writer really taught me how to find the hook to keep the the reader involved, be funny. And that was my first experience of having to deliver on deadlines. Graduate student, you can always pile up the incompletes, and I think I had seven at one point. One of my classmates had 13, so I wasn't the worst. (laughs) I took a few years to finish those seven incompletes, but you know, you can miss deadlines as a sports writer, but then you don't get paid. And I was freelance. So it was a question of how much I wanted to get paid. And so I, mm. money wasn't great, but it was some money. And I would I just keep, they'd pay me every time I'd add a, an article to my website. The, the company eventually went bankrupt. So you can't find this stuff online anymore. That's too bad. Maybe someday I'll publish it. I have them all. So that sports writing experience was very positive for me. Then I finished my PhD. Peg Birmingham, who was then the chair at DePaul, was still there, offered me a one-year visiting assistant professorship gig, which was my first full-time adult job with health insurance and a salary and all that. So I, right. I took it, stayed in Chicago for a year doing that. And I wasn't planning to become a philosophy professor at that point. Really? I, I had, no, I'd been kind of scarred by my graduate student experiences. I see. And so I'd saved up some money. And I thought I was just going to go to Paris and see what happens because it seemed mm-hmm. like a lot was going on in Paris. I had, in the meantime, made the acquaintance of Bruno Latour. I thought that'd be a chance to be around him. I had met him in the, met him in the fall of 99, but we, we started corresponding in the spring of 99. But then the offer from DePaul changed that. 
because I was in Chicago. The Jobs for Philosophers came out, and I thought, hey, now that I'm here, I might as well apply for some jobs. The ones that jumped out at me immediately were American University and Cairo American University of Beirut. I ended up getting, I think, five interviews at the APA, of which my clear favorite was the American University in Cairo, and things worked out. I got that job, and that was one of the most exciting days of my life, getting the offer from the American University in Cairo. I'd never been anywhere other than Europe, Mexico, and, and a frequent flyer ticket to Rio de Janeiro. So Egypt was something totally foreign for me. And boy, was that a learning experience. It was a life changer. And when I went there later, and I was sitting on search committees there, I still wondered why we didn't get more applications than we did. You know, it was more like 30 to 40 rather than the 200. That right. up. I just kept thinking there are a lot of people out there who don't know what they're missing. That was a dream job in many ways. Obviously, some people have personal life issues where they just can't pick up and move to Cairo, but I didn't have any. I was you know, totally by myself and ready to pick up and move. And that's what I did. And everything that's happened has happened because of that. I mean, for one thing, it, the teaching load was 3-3, but two of the classes were always intro every semester. So it was two course prep every semester. And so a lot of free time. And uh, the sun was good for my mood. I was one of those <laughs> gloomy, gloomy graduate students in Chicago. I grew up in Iowa, so I'm used to gloomy mm-hmm. winters and cold winters. And wind. <laughs> All right, right. And then the sun every day, it just your mood is, is up every day and mm-hmm. constant mental stimulation from being in this totally new environment, having to learn a new language, all these incredible historical things around you that you can explore. Cairo is one of the great late night cities of the world. It's up there with New York because it's too hot during the day. People bring their, bring their kids out at midnight. There's so many great things about Cairo. Also, the university itself is pretty financially flush. I mean, like everyone else, they're having problems now, but they it's a university that caters to the elite of Egyptian society. They do give out scholarships, but it's primarily like the American University of Beirut, a, a class thing. It's, it buys social capital for the upper classes of those societies. And so uh, they're generous with grant money. Mm. Uh, and, and so every summer, as long as I was productive, which I made sure to be, I mm-hmm. would go, I'd get a grant to go to Paris for a month or to go to Chicago once, or I went back to Santa Fe for a month once, and, and they would give you conference grants with little problem as long as you were productive. And, and the other thing that helped me was that I had absolutely zero chance of tenure when I arrived. Because in order to avoid corruption, as an anti-corruption measure, they had a hard cap of 60% tenured in every department because they wanted to um, force departments to make hard decisions and not just tenure their friends. I see, I see. And so when I got there, it was already over 60%. And there had been a big battle over tenure between two people a couple mm-hmm. years before me, and they ended up having to give it to both of them, but that put them over the cap. So I had no chance at tenure. And so it was going to be a two-year or a four-year job. I was going to milk it to the max. And then at some point, the ground rules changed a bit. The provost started to say, well, obviously, if someone has an incredible record, they introduced this thing called floating tenure, which meant the provost would have six discretionary slots to shift around that he could give above and beyond the 60% quota. And I thought, well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of in range for that because I, mm-hmm. I became a hard worker and diligent writer for the first time in my life, really, to the point that I had three books out by the time I was up for tenure. And those are, are Tool Being Guerrilla Metaphysics and Heidegger Explained. Right. Plus a smattering of articles and conference papers. And there was still a political hurdle, which I won't go into the details here, but uh, philosophy was technically still part of English and comparative literature then. And the request for a floating tenure slot had to come from your chair. And for various reasons, the English and comparative literature chair was not in the same faction I was and was never going to request for me to get a chance at tenure. So gotcha. we had to split into a separate department for that to be possible. I was acting philosophy head for a semester while our wise old unit head was away on sabbatical. And in the midst of that, I uncovered a scheme to pretend to the provost that there wasn't enough office space for philosophy to become a separate department. And I discovered this through accidental means, which was going to mean that I had zero chance at tenure because of this person trying to to kill me. And I uncovered it. And then I offered to sacrifice my own office to become the new chair's office. I solved the problem single-handedly. I love it. Wrote it to the provost and copied the two people who were trying to stop me. One of them, the dean, who is no longer alive. And that solved the problem. And the provost responded with, Graham, that is a very, very constructive suggestion. <laughs> and then, of course, the dean and the other person trying to stop me had to flatter me, too, in front of the provost on that email exchange. So it was a delicious moment <laughs> where I won my first political battle in academia. And you have, you have to do that. You have to yeah. keep your eyes open. There's 30 people in academia. So one thing led to another. I got tenure. 
And uh, I don't know how much more of this you want to hear. There no, it's great. I know people like to hear the inside baseball sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Because sometimes prominent people in philosophy present themselves as just being steamrollers of excellence who yeah, ran through it. Exactly. I, I had all kinds of problems, people. Whatever problems <laughs> you had on your rise in academia, I had worse ones. And I'm not even going to go into all of them here. But <laughs> right. So then my tenure case went through. Apparently, all the letters were great. And then guess what? They forgot to take my tenure file to the board meeting in New York. Uh, they came back with all the tenure and promotion cases that year, except mine was the one that they forgot to do. And it was a, it was a clerical error with a staff member with whom I later became great friends. I'd okay. say, I'd say I, I wasn't great friends with her at the time. So it wasn't a conspiracy. It wasn't a conspiracy then. Well, no, except that I had my suspicions because right. for whatever reasons. But it was a very nice Egyptian staff member who we, I, I gave her my kitten later. She's a wonderful person when I had to... Oh. Anyway, it was just, it was a misunderstanding, but I didn't feel that way at the time. I right. felt like, so I think what they did is they promoted me right away so that at least my, to associate prof so that my salary wouldn't be held back for another year. But they, I did have to wait until the next board meeting in October. So it was another semester before I was tenure, but they, they told me it was no worries. And then they tried to make it up to me by inviting me to a party at the president's house, which I never knew about. They ne the invitation never reached me. And so I ran into the provost in the lounge a day, the day after that president's party, and he was giving me the dirtiest look in the world because he thought I was blowing them off. On right. Anger, which I had no idea that there yeah. was a president. Yeah. So one thing after another. <laughs> well. <laughs> but you yeah. persevered. Yes, that's right. <laughs> now, there's one other story I want to tell. Uh, sure. Which was from before tenure, just because I think it'll amuse people. Mm -hmm. It's not known. This was about Tool Being, which was published in 2002, two years before I went up for tenure. Let's see, they got one blurb on the back from Lingus. Mm -hmm. I always loved my work, so that wasn't surprising. And so then Open Court asked me, hey, can you think of any Europeans who might do a blurb so that we can market it in Europe as well? And just by pure chance, I had met Johnny Vadimo once at a table in, in Torino because one of my friends from DePaul had been Vadimo's student in Italy. Mm -hmm. And Vadimo was really nice. And so I thought, okay, I'll try Vadimo. He seemed like a nice character. So I, I sent it to him. And I got this nice blurb from Vadimo that you can see on the back of Tool Being. But the, the story is remarkable behind that. It speaks well of Vadimo that he, he gave me the blurb despite what happened. What happened was <laughs> they sent it to him a few months after 9-11. And this was in the middle of uh, all that anthrax stuff that was going on. And mm. Open Court sent him the manuscript of Tool Being in one of those cheap envelopes that's stuffed with Oh, wings. God. And one of his assistants tore the envelope open and all this cloud of lint goes in the air. And Vadimo and his staff burst into a panic because he, he was a European parliament member. And oh God, he would be a possible target of terrorism, mm -hmm. right? And so they, they had to surround the whole university building in Torino. And Tool Being was, was sent to the Italian <laughs> crime lab in Rome and investigators of weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, and uh, then the funny thing is in 2017, I was a visiting professor in that very building. Maybe I was even in Vadimo's office. Who knows? So that came full circle 16 years later. <laughs> right. Oh, that's an amazing anyway. story. Sorry, I've talked a lot here about one No, question. it's That's great. And stuff, I'll give you a, a second to catch your breath and hydrate if, if you need, but I love that you never told the story about the possible terrorism uh, <laughs> yes. scandal that you may have been involved in, but that's great. And that's an interesting being, example yeah. of an object, right? Yes, well, it is. In terms of its prop, I forget what the, uh, what is it? The, not the unattainable nature of the object, but I, I don't know. It withdrawn, kind of withdrawn. It. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. For a moment there, you, you even suggested, I'm not sure which work it was in, but you suggested some pushback against the term withdrawn and perhaps someone saying that you plagiarized their, their notion of it. And you suggested, well, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll say that the object withholds its qualities, right. but, but you don't seem, you seem to have moved past that, that terminological dispute. And it's obvious that I forget the, the author, but it's obvious that you get the word withdrawn from a translation of Heidegger. It's one right. of the, so I, I guess that that, do you have anything interesting to say about that? This, this question about uh, whether qualities are withheld or withdrawn? Yes, I do. I don't know that anyone's ever accused me of plagiarizing that. I've always been clear that it's from Heidegger and I tend to be loyal to terminology. I mean, there are people in mm. philosophy who think all you have to get to do is get the terminology right and that will avoid all misunderstandings. I've never felt that way. I've always preferred to use existing older terminology and just stipulate the differences in what I mean by it compared to what mm -hmm. other people mean by it. And so I rarely change. So example, for example, I kept withdrawn for many years to show my debt to Heidegger. Mm -hmm. I've kept object for many years, even though people prefer things or entities, because I got that from the Aust Austrian tradition, Brentano and Husserl, 
Meinong. And so I wanted to express my loyalty to them. I just simply stipulate, here's the difference between Triple O's object and Meinong's object or Husserl's object. But uh, with withdrawn, there's a special problem, I think, which is that it was a question of, after a paper that made me, made me realize this, which is the, if you say withdrawn, people think that the default state of things that is it's there on the table in front of you. Mm-hmm. And then for some mysterious reason, it withdraws. And that's, I see. I was trying to say, no, that's not it. It's that the default state is that you're not able to access it. And so that's right. why I switched to withhelds. And I don't want to say withholds itself, which is the usual way, because that adds this note of self-reflexivity that mm-hmm. isn't there in my, it's just it withholds. The object withholds. It doesn't withhold itself. So otherwise, I try not to coin a lot of terminology, unlike my friend Tim Morton, who is great at coining neologisms, like hyper objects and the mesh and strange stranger. I prefer to use classical terminology because that's my background. I see triple O as a, a weird form of Aristotle's philosophy extended in the 22nd century, mm-hmm. 21st century. Sorry, I guess I'm a century ahead of myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, uh, it's good to be ahead of ourselves like that. Yeah. Right. yeah. That follow-up is your allegiance to this word weird, which you have used here or there, particularly in your book on Lovecraft. Now, did you, did that first come to you from Lovecraft or was this, or was this another source with this notion of a, a weird formalism or a weird realism? Do you have any insights into that or is that just another happy coincidence? Well, I had this German teacher in high school who was kind of a crazy guy in some ways, but he made the most fascinating speeches. He was a generally educated man and he, one day he got into the etymology of the word, word weird and he's talking about Macbeth, of course, the Weird Sisters. And for some reason, that left a big impression on me. And so that was always in the back of my mind since high school. And then, of course, when I encountered Lovecraft, which was late. I mean, Lovecraft is usually an early discovery, teenage right. years. I didn't discover him until his Library of America volume came out, which was in 2005. I mean, I'd heard the name, but I'd spent all my time reading anyway. And it was all academic, serious stuff. And I never thought I had the time to read a what I thought was a pulp Poor right. writer. So then I picked up the Library of America volume because I thought, wow, they really think he's that good. He's as good as Poe. Maybe I should give him a shot mm-hmm. because I'm a big Poe fan. I have been for a long time. And I have to say, I didn't get the Lovecraft right away. Those, those stories in Library of America are in chronological order. I see. And so it's got that Randolph Carter stuff at the beginning, which is okay, but it's not. it didn't grab me. It took until the Call of Cthulhu for me to right. say, wow, this guy can write. This guy can really write. And then it really took over my mind for a while. And uh, then I saw that Lovecraft fit perfectly with triple O. And then I started yep. using using weird as a technical term. And a lot of uh, reviewers have taken shots at that. Christopher Norris is one, mm-hmm. made fun of me for using the word weird as did his disciple, uh, Fabio Gironi. But I just said, look, it's a technical term. Mm-hmm. I'm not just saying it's weird in the sense of it's strange and that's cool. Weird is a technical term for triple O and Shakespeare pioneered a serious use of that word. The weird sisters. It's there's mm-hmm. something that's not quite present. There's something about these sisters you can't quite get. And those mm-hmm. witches are still downright scary. If you go back and read Macbeth, three of the great horror characters in world literature. So yeah, Macbeth is where the, that all comes from. And then Lovecraft secondarily. And there's the new, uh, I think one of the Cohen brothers that's still making films has uh, just released a new version of Macbeth with, um, I think Denzel is Macbeth himself. Oh, okay. I think um, Francis McDormand is Lady Macbeth, I believe. I saw some still photos and it looks creepy. I want to see it. Definitely it. Yeah, absolutely. Graham, a uh, personal question. Do you, are you someone that has ever been, had an interest in comic books by chance? No, my brothers no. both were, but I, I never was. Gotcha. Okay. I was more into sports, which I know is strange for someone in philosophy. So, I mean, we were too. That's kind of funny. Oh yeah. 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 I think. yeah. Interesting. And uh, my interest in sports, I don't, because my parents weren't interested in sports. They became hmm. fan, fans later through me. So I grew up in a household where that wasn't a thing. My grandfather's, yes. But I, I discovered it independently through trading cards, through basketball yes, cards first yes. and baseball cards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then through older brothers and friends at school who knew a lot mm-hmm. more than I did. So I became a super sports fan from the age of eight. Mm-hmm. I, sh- I should take one, back, one thing back about what I said about my parents. My mother was a big watcher of the 1975 World Series, Reds, Red Sox. Okay. Was- Trying to get me into it. I wasn't into it. I was seven. But then the next year, spring of 76, the Boston Celtics, that Celtic Suns final, that's when I really blossomed as a sports fan. When you uh, did your sports journalism, was this mainly focused on one sport like basketball or did you do multiple sports? No, I was an opinion writer primarily. And they let me, they liked my writing style. So they gave me carte mm-hmm. blanche to write about anything in sports. And uh, I did end up doing some reporting, but it isn't really my bag. You have to cultivate, yeah. cultivate relationships with the players. And I did have some interesting experiences. I got to meet a number of the Cubs, including Sammy Sosa. Awesome. Uh, 
Doug Glanville was the best person I met on the Cubs. He came mm. up and greeted me. I didn't have to greet him. Oh, okay. I, he works for ESPN now. He's a UPenn graduate, so he's, he's an Ivy League graduate, which is rare for a baseball player. And then I have my infamous encounter with Bobby Knight that I've talked about. <laughs> oh, I want to hear this. Yeah, this oh, is great. I like to think I had a small part in getting him fired eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my great life stories. I was a DePaul graduate student, so I was mm. fairly easy. It was hard. It was impossible for me to get Bulls tickets then because they said, <laughs> sports extra, who's that? You're not getting tickets. Everyone uh, in the world. So I never got Bulls tickets. I got Cubs, Bears, and uh, DePaul was easy right? It's a college sports program and they'd seen better days, but I got tickets for the DePaul Indiana game. I got to sit in the press box for that. Afterwards, I got to go into the uh, press room and they, Indiana destroyed DePaul that night by 30 some points. And Bobby Knight walks in and just bullies everyone. He starts off by talking about the big 10 postseason tournament, which had just been approved that day for the first time. And he's swearing, you know, God damn it. I don't know what <laughs> the hell the big Ten's thinking of, and I'm totally against this shit, but what was his other line? The other first line was, um, but God damn it, if they're going to do something, they ought to got They ought to do something for the families of the kids because these kids are from poor families and the families of the poor kids can't even afford to get in. God damn it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other reporters all seemed cowed by that. And so they started asking him about the game, which was a total mm -hmm. bore. There was really nothing to ask about. Paul was slaughtered in that game. After about three of those questions, I raised my hand and said, I want to go back to the uh, points you made about the Big Ten tournament. And I, I deliberately pressed this button with something I knew he was against. And I said, um, okay, if you want to give free tickets to the parents of the players, why not just pay the players a small salary, right? Because they're from if they're from underprivileged families, as you say, don't they deserve part of the major earnings from this sport? Which, of course, now everyone's starting to agree with. This was 1996. It was still early for that. And he said, no, I'm not in favor of that. But I'll tell you something. The president of the University of Minnesota makes me want to vomit. And then he said, uh, he hasn't cared about the kids since Christ was in Omaha. <laughs> and uh, I saw two weeks later, they lost to Iowa, my hometown team. <laughs> in City. He continued it. He said, we haven't shot from the three-point range that badly since Jesus was holding revivals in Omaha. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, That's weird. And so then I told my German friend about it, and he was trying to start a phrase in German, Zeit dem Jesu in Omaha. <laughs> kind of, kind of a, a German catchphrase. It didn't work. But, and then uh, Mike Francesa in New York, a New Yorker told me that showed up on Mike Francesa's show. <laughs> he, he said on his show that night, people, Bobby Knight is really losing. Here's what he said last night after the DePaul game. And keep it in mind, this, this is the Midwest. People take their religion seriously out there. Right, right. <laughs> so I, I caused a small whirlpool in the sports world there for a little while. That was my highlight as a sports writer. Ah, that's for, hilarious. For sure. And then Bobby Knight was fired in, I guess it was 2000. Not that long afterwards. Four I mean, years that, after. Yeah, it spelled the, the beginning of the end. Before going deeper into, into some of uh, you know your philosophy, because all of this is it's just as interesting and stuff that I hadn't heard of. And, and I assume many of our many of your readers and our, our listeners haven't heard of. I wanted to ask about I guess I wanted to um, I'm not trying to lose my train of thought, but I, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask about this notion of your background in German and German philosophy, because am I wrong that you have translated a book from German or is this a three, three books? You translated three. I saw one yeah. of them on the history of Palestine, I believe. Right. Do you want to, do you want to tell us a little bit of, as, as a fellow translator? I, I, I just want to ask about your oh, yeah. experiences with it and how you got into it and just your general thoughts. Sure. Uh, when I went to high school, so that's ninth grade where I, I lived, there were two languages and the languages, it was an unusual combination. It was German or Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I was 14. And the only reason I chose German is because I was 14. I knew what I was going to do in the future. Mm -hmm. I, think I, I was into computers then, video games, like a lot of kids. And I think I saw some catalog for a university where the computer science department required you to learn German, French, or Russian. I think it was Iowa State. I was in Iowa and Iowa State was the big technical school in Iowa. So I thought, okay, well, that means computer science programs are going to want you to have German, French, or Russian. And so I'll do German. So I took German and I wasn't a, wasn't a hard worker in high school. So I didn't come out of high school speaking German well or anything, mm -hmm. but I had four years. And you, if you hear German for four years, you know what it's supposed to sound like. You know where the stresses fall in sentences. Mm -hmm. It gives you a basis. You know some of the words. So that was that. And then I went to St. John's, which teaches ancient Greek and French. So mm -hmm. I wasn't going to get any German then. And then I <laughs> really got into Heidegger sophomore year. Mm -hmm. And I quickly read all the stuff in English. And I saw the Gesamtausgabe in German in our college library, which I I tried to read through Zeinon Sites in German, but my mm. high, school, high school German wasn't enough for that. 
So I said, I'm going to have to get more serious about this. And so I applied for one of those Goethe Institute uh, summer courses, and I got a zero interest loan from my college to do it. That was summer of 89. It's my first trip to Europe. We weren't in a family that traveled a lot. We were impoverished hippies. So traveling to Europe wasn't the kind of thing that happened in our family. But that was a huge experience for me, obviously. And I got to see East Berlin about three weeks before it fell. Wow. With no hint that that was going to happen. And I got to, I took a side trip to Amsterdam and I went to Switzerland. And so that kind of excited this small town Iowa kid about the wider world. And it was the beginning of, I don't know, I've probably had 160 trips to Europe by now because I'm a 53-year-old academic. But uh, that's something that doesn't come from my background. I had a grandfather who dreamed of traveling and looked at atlases all the time, but he was a child of the depression and, and never had had four kids pretty quickly. He was never able to do it. Right. And uh, so that was something new in my family. That there was somebody who really dreamed of this and made a lifestyle out of travel, which I've done. But anyway, about German. So I went to the Goethe Institute. That was before my senior year. Mm -hmm. Went on to Penn State where I said, okay, I want to be a Heidegger expert. I'm going to have to read the whole Gesamtausgabe in German. So I started with the Beiträge zur Philosophie because it was pretty new. It was going to be years to translate that, obviously, because it's kind of a mess linguistically. And it wasn't well translated the first time, I don't believe, right? The, no, no. Yeah. And that was that was still years away anyway. I don't mean to bring up, you know, yeah. I'm not, not trying to talk trash about anybody. No, it's, it's just, that's the consensus, correct? The contributions was... Yeah, it's a little yeah. precious. A little mm -hmm. precious. So I just simply sat down every day with the dictionary and read as much of the Beiträge as I could. And I'd look up every word. I didn't know what it meant. And with Heidegger, the Beiträge, that means there's some crazy words that don't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I'd have to figure that out, which ones mm -hmm. really exist, which ones don't. Veronique Futi was actually a help. She was a professor at Penn State and her German was outstanding. I think she went to school in Switzerland when she was young. So she helped me with understanding some of the non-existent words. My German was good enough to pass my German exam for graduate school, but it, was, it took me a year and a half to finish the Beiträge. So then I went to Paul, I finished the Beiträge, and I say, what do I want to read next? I want to read the 2930 course. This is important, yeah. Which my advisor, Will McNeil, was still translating at the time. So it was going to be a few, it took another three years for that to come out. So I said, I'm going to read that next. And I sat down in a cafe. At, I had two lucky cafes in Chicago, Equinox and Trevi, where I could always sit down and write masterful seminar presentations in a couple of hours. And nice. so I went, went to one of these lucky cafes and sat down with the German of, uh, of the 1929-30 course and read the first three pages without a lexicon because this is normal German. It's not the Beiträge. This is Heidegger speaking to undergrads. Right. I said, oh, that was easy. Mm -hmm. And then before I knew it, I had read 75 pages of it without getting up from the table, without using the bathroom. Wow. And I thought, oh my God, I can do this. Mm -hmm. One of those great moments as a graduate student. I can actually mm -hmm. read German now because I slaved through a year and a half of the Beiträge. This is not going to be a problem. And, and then each book becomes easier because every author has a limited vocabulary, right? Right. Heidegger uses the same words over and over. And then, so by age 29, I, I had read literally every volume of Heidegger, which was, I don't know, 73 volumes by that point. Right. And there was not going to be any other grad student in America who had done that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Definitely not. So that was, on the one hand, that was a confidence builder, that no one's going to mm -hmm. surprise me with something I don't know about Heidegger. And Heidegger has his problems, but if you're grounded in Heidegger, you're grounded in 20th century continental philosophy, because yes. everything in some way relates positively or negatively to him. And the other thing is, there are some sneaky Heideggerians who always like to quote from the latest GA volume that no one's read yet and try to ambush you that way. They weren't going to be able to do that with me because I was <laughs> reading them before they did. I spent a lot of money doing that. That's part of why I got into heavy, heavy student debt that I didn't pay off till age 50, three mm. years ago. I'm on that track. So yeah, well, same, same. There's there's light at the end of the tunnel, but you're you're going to be struggling in your 50s, like I am. Don't own a house. I, you know, you're not going to have any capital in your 50s. Oh right, right. Yeah, 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 definitely. I'm not in the capitalist club. People assume that since I'm well known, I must be rich. Very funny. Very very funny joke. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, if you're if you're not from a family with money and you have to take a lot of student loans, you're not yep. going to have any capital in your 50s. But my, yeah. That was the situation with my hippie parents too. So it doesn't intimidate me. They're doing fine, and I'm going to do fine. Oh, okay, translation. Sorry, Taylor. Yeah, no, no, this is this is wonderful. I love it. So I was in good shape to translate a book with all that, right? And then at one point, uh, Christina Lafont, who's still a professor at, at uh, Northwestern, asked someone at the, she a, she asked Amy Allen, who's now at Penn State, who was her Northwestern graduate student, do you know anybody who can translate a book on Heidegger? And mm. she said she'll ask her husband Chris, who was my classmate at DePaul, because there's all these continental philosophy people there. And Chris thought of me. I was living in Iowa City at the time, but breaking up with my fiance at the time. And so I, I wasn't going to stay around Iowa City. I thought I'll go back to Chicago, get some extra teaching. And then I ended up living with Christina and Axel and Evanston, translating Christina's book while 
while teaching a little bit to Paul and then also doing sports writing, which I didn't know was going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I ended up a couple of years in Evanston doing that, translating her book, which you can get from Cambridge. It's called Heidegger Language and World Disclosure. That's my first okay. translation. Then when I got to Egypt, it hit me at some point, hey, that's a skill. And I can maybe make some money off it because Cambridge didn't pay me that much. I, Cambridge, mm-hmm. Cambridge didn't pay me anything. I got paid by a Northwestern faculty development grant and it was four or 5,000 or something. It was, uh, I think the next translation offer was from Nicholas Largier, who was on my committee at DePaul. He's now in German at Berkeley, and he wrote that history of whipping in praise of the whip. And that was for Zone. And I think I got paid like 13 or 14 because he asked me to do it. We got along well. And he, he offered, I think Zone offered, th- or somebody offered 13 or 14,000 for that. I said, wow, that's real money. That's, uh, yeah, that's nice. That's how my student loan debt is going to get dented. <laughs> so then I started writing to presses and I think pr- I wrote to Princeton and Princeton asked me if I wanted to translate the history of Palestine. Right. And uh, there's one story about that, which is that they wanted me to do a 24 page translation sample of the intro, which I did. And I celebrated by going off to Alexandria, Egypt for the weekend, my favorite getaway on the Mediterranean and got home to discover that the computer had eaten the whole 24 pages. Oh, that, I, that's happened. And that is gut wrenching. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I had to spend another week doing that over again. And nothing is worse than redoing work you've already done. It's painful. Mm-hmm. But I wanted the job, so I did it. They accepted it. And I think they paid me eighteen or 19000 at Princeton. But then that was such a miserable experience for various reasons that I, I decided, look, I want to focus on my own work. Yes, I, I see. Because at a certain point, you find out that translation is using the same brain space as original work. You can't yep. really do both at once. I agree. And I wanted to switch to writing my second book, Real Metaphysics. So I said, no more translation. And then the only translation I've done since then is either small passages from my own books, or I, mm-hmm. I did end up translating French. The Maisu. Exactly. And now that was a story. And the story is simply that I didn't have any French in high school because it wasn't offered. At St. John's, we use that Palmieri Milligan French for reading knowledge, which is an outstanding book. I recommend that to everybody. So that in uh, six weeks, I was reading Rousseau with no dictionary because it's such a good book and I didn't have to learn to speak it. My, I still get, right. shy about, still get shy about speaking French. I've lectured twice in French, but from a, a text I wrote in advance. I see. I, I'm bad at conversations. Someone says, comment ça va? And I freeze up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need a few beers before I can start speaking another language, right? So. Uh, but uh, reading French is no problem. And then once I met Latour was sending me his manuscripts ahead of time to comment mm-hmm. on them. And so then at one point, I decided to write that. But somebody, I persuaded somebody to write a, a reader's guide to after finitude mm-hmm. for, for, okay. for Edinburgh for my series. That person backed out for several reasons. And so Edinburgh asked me if I want to write the reader's guide to after finitude. And I said, no, if I'm going to write on Mayo Su, I want to write a, a broader philosophical coming to terms with him. And I, I knew Mayo Su. And so I I contacted him and said, could I maybe have access to, uh, no, can I comment on the divine in existence? Right. Mm-hmm. And Mayasu thought about it because he's, Mayasu is really the closest thing to a true perfectionist I have ever I met. That makes sense since he's so guarded with that, that work. He is. He's, I mean, he's written a lot more than he's published. He has not published much. Right. He, ha- he has so many manuscripts and and he's just such a perfectionist that he doesn't want anything in the market to be perfect unless it's perfect. I'm different. I kind of feel like you write the best you can. You get feedback. Yes. That, en- that enables conversations to happen. You can change mm-hmm. your views on things. You're not committed to what you write in one book. You can evolve your views. So I have, I'm at the opposite. And, and it's probably because I just suffered so much from my graduate school self, which was the perfectionist. Yes, I see. Rewriting the first chapter of my dissertation for three years. And it's, it's misery for me to do that. So I, I had to become more of a writing mm-hmm. hysteric and just put mm-hmm. everything out in the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect. So anyway, Mayasu thought about it. And he came back to me with an interesting response. His response was, I don't want you to be talking about the divine in existence unless the readers can see the original text for themselves. Yes. And I said, okay, but Edinburgh's not going to want me to have a 200 page French appendix. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm going to have to translate it. Uh, Is it okay? It's not 200. It's less than that. But, and so Mayasu sent me the, uh, not the dissertation version, the revision he had made, I think in 2003 or something. So I spent the whole summer of 2010 going through that in Paris on a Cairo research grant. Mm Mm-hmm picking out the passages that I thought were the most relevant. I deliberately excluded all the ones where he's talking about other philosophers like Hegel and Heidegger. Those are great too, but I wanted just Mayo Soup. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I translated those. And uh, so that's how that ended up in the book. That was my biggest trans- French translation job ever. So that's my translation story, Taylor. And one of these days I want to hear yours because you have a stellar career behind you already and maybe more ahead, I don't know. As a yeah, French I mean, you know, the, that, that was something that I, I, I didn't know about you and learning that in the past few weeks was something where I was like another layer of of sort of coincidence another another thing that we can bond over and translating the Mayasu is really 
because he is such a perfectionist, the fact that you were given that privilege, I mean, people are kind of, if, if there is a book in French continental philosophy that is, that sort of has a lot of expectation behind it, it is divine in existence. Yes. Uh, and it's almost because it's, it's almost like getting teased and tantalized, right? So, right. so getting, so getting some of the, the bulk of that out there, that's a huge endeavor and accomplishment. And I guess that for me, you know, this was kind of how I felt about the Simon Don, which I've kind of put into the questions I have for you today. But my thing, which which I want to hear about, which which fascinated me, was your passing interest in Simon Don, if at least for a way to pit your understanding of the role of of Triple O versus, say, maybe someone like Deleuze or or even Delanda. Right. In terms of the, you said that sometimes people will play the Simon Don card against you. This question of well, what about the pre-individual, right? right. Is, is I assume how they would come back at you. My thing would be less to use him as a foil against your work. And just, I'm wondering, because you do claim Aristotle as one of the, I don't want to say triple O inherits Aristotle or something, right. but he's one of the forerunners, you could say. I wonder about if you are sympathetic to what I find to be one of the main enemies for Simon Don and Deleuze and, and sort of those who come in his wake, which is this attack against the hylomorphic yes. model of form and matter. And you yourself, I'll wrap up here because I said a lot, but, but you yourself have stated very convincingly that you want to keep the notion of form and formalism and that mm-hmm. it's important for you while matter is something that is, uh, let's just say it's, it's something that gets in the way maybe. Do you want to say maybe a little bit about uh, any of that? Yes. So yes, I appreciate the critique of hylomorphism. But I don't appreciate that people want to keep the matter part of it mm-hmm. rather than yes. the form part of it. Matter is definitely there in Aristotle, and I think it's his most problematic concept. And that's not, that's not what I like about it. Mm-hmm. Let, let me say something about, first of all, the fact that we're still in a period when speaking in favor of flux and change and everything mm-hmm. is moving and nothing is stable is still a very prestigious intellectual model. Remember one of my dissertation committee members saying I was defending a static model of reality? No, I'm not. I'm defending a model in which change has to be earned. Yeah, It's not static. It's that if you say stuff is changing all the time, then it's too easy. You don't have to explain change. It's built into Mm. the fabric of everything. And a lot of times philosophers of flux have to emphasize change twice because first they're saying, saying, oh, everything's changing all the time. There's this orgasmic level of flux in the cosmos. Everything's Mm -hmm. in movement. But then they also want to be playing the mantle of radical political change. If you're in favor of radical ontological change is always happening, then radical political change is no different from a... right plantation economy that never changes. They're both radical ontological change, right? In order to emphasize that second level of we need political change, they have to add a second degree of change Mm. that shouldn't be necessary, giving the ontological change they're already building into everything. Here's an example. I've I've just started reading Thomas Nail's books because I don't know if you know them, but Nail is one of the young new materialists. He's at the University of Denver and people are recommending Mm -hmm. his books. And he's a wonderfully systematic young thinker who is very much in the camp of everything's changing all the time and triple O is too static. One argument that Nail repeatedly makes is you have to start with flux, because if you start with individuals, you can't get to flux. But if you start from flux, you can get to individuals. Mm-hmm. And I've got a response to that. First of all, you can't really get individuals. You get things like feedback loops where the flux mm-hmm. loop is intersecting itself, and that creates the appearance of an individual. But here's the other issue. Why do you have to start with one or the other? I think you have to account for both at the beginning. And this is what Aristotle does. I see. People don't realize... The best way to differentiate between the metaphysics and the physics is that the physics is where he talks about the continuum, right? Right. Zeno is wrong because you can't break up space into individual spaces. You can't break up time into individual times. Growth processes are not made of any definite number of individual growths. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then the metaphysics, it's about substance. So how many pieces of space are in the room I'm sitting in here? And the physics, Aristotle tells us no definite number. It's potential. You can cut up the room however you want. How many units of time are in this podcast? No definite number. Cut it mm-hmm. up the way you want. How many people are involved in the contest in this podcast? Three. It's not, well, it depends on how you slice it up. Maybe there's five people here. Maybe there's five. That's right. absurd. It's absurd. So in other words, you need to have the discrete, uh, somehow account for the discrete. Because what usually happens is some, some people go so far as to say, well, there isn't any definite number of people here. My mind is cutting this up into three people based on custom. That happens with uh, Levinas in the early period. It also happens with Ladyman and Ross, the uh, mm-hmm. structural realists, the analytic philosophy. But then and Anaxagoras, right? Noose makes the up here on spin and break into pieces. But then why is mind separate enough from the whole in the first place that it can do that? You're already distinguishing between the mind and everything else. Why not distinguish between things in the everything else? 
Right. So that's my objection to Flux. The other objection I have to it is that it always has this perpetual air of novelty, but it's been going since Bergson's time, right? That you've, you've, mm-hmm. Bergson's great. You can find that in him. You, you can find that in Benjamin Lee Worf's work on linguistics, where he's praising the Hopi Indian language for being better for quantum physics because they can talk about flashing stuff better. Than, this has been around for a long time. This idea that, oh, Indo-European grammar naively mm-hmm. splits things up into nouns and verbs. Everything's really a verb. It doesn't work philosophically. If you try to work out the details, you need nouns, you need substances. And yeah, there's all kinds of stuff wrong with traditional substance theory, like the idea that it's eternal, the idea that uh, nature privileges certain substances. So Aristotle Mm -hmm. can't tell you about airplanes or or, uh, Manchester United or these other objects I like to talk about. Right. You need Latour for that. But then Latour is not a substance philosopher like I want to be. Latour Mm -hmm. treats things relationally like Whitehead. So if you want to be able to talk about all different scales... And you want to be able to talk about substances. Triple is the only game in town. Both of those things are never found together in any other philosophy. And those come from philosophical needs that I felt for both of those things. Differences of scale and the fact that something is not dependent on its components or on its effects, that something is in between those two extremes. See, I, I like this notion because it is there is something to it that if if change is the undercurrent of everything, if then to a certain extent, you also... As you say, you kind of end up with a gradualism, correct? Like, yes. where is this also one of your um, critiques of Latour, where if everything's relational, it's hard to have a difference in kind where you're seemingly only left with differences degree. And so if everything is changed, then nothing is changed or that change is somehow downplayed yes. or real change. And my book, Immaterialism, is the place where I take that on. Because for Latour, as for Whitehead, Every single thing an entity does is important to its constitution. It changes Mm -hmm. it. So if a hair falls off my head, I'm a new person. If I move to Egypt, I'm a new person. Well, I can tell Mm -hmm. you which one affected me more. Right. (laughs) And so all you're left then with with Latour's model, and he's my favorite living philosopher. I don't mean to say anything bad about Latour. He is, I think he's changed everything for me. Mm -hmm. And maybe soon for European philosophy as a whole. We'll see. But but, um, for Latour, you end up having to, how do you distinguish between a hair falling off my head and me moving to Egypt? by quantitative impact, right? That you could say a hair falling off my head affected me by 0.1 units of change and right. <laughs> Egypt by 10,000 or something. But the fact is certain things happen to entities that simply don't matter at all, like a hair falling off my head, that you can invent some weird scenario where that would affect me, but it's very unlikely to affect who I am. Egypt did affect me a lot. And also I didn't affect Egypt appreciably. Egypt right. has been thousands of years. Egypt doesn't care that I was there. It doesn't change Egyptian history. So many big things have happened there. So it's, it's an asymmetrical change that affects, yes. like, whereas modern idea of relations, like Newtonian gravity, the sun pulls on me, but I also pull on the sun a little bit. But I needed to account for the fact that sometimes there's no effect whatsoever. And so the case of the Dutch East India Company, my hypothesis was there were probably a half dozen or so things that changed it, right? Not going to be an infinite number and it's not going to be nothing. And if you leave it in the hands of actor network theory, they're going to look for the quantitatively biggest things, like which business deal was worth the most money, right? Right. which battle had the most casualties. Those aren't necessarily the biggest things that happened. I brought in Margulis's idea of symbiosis because that's what her concept does in biology. It allows you to pinpoint big jumps in evolution. Yes, Gold and and Eldridge do that too, but for them, it's more climactic stuff. It works better for that, punctuated Mm -hmm. equilibrium. Mm -hmm. For Margulis, it's about two life forms coming together and forming a new life form. And that's the model I wanted to use. Her book was one of the biggest influences on me, uh, Symbiotic Planet. Al Lingus recommended her to me. Mm. Glad, he, glad he did. So you start looking at the Dutch East India Company, and then I started thinking, okay, what are the kinds of things that could influence the Dutch East India Company? It's going to be another noun. It's going to be like a symbiosis. Two things come together. And in English, nouns are person, place, or thing. So I started thinking, what are the people, places, and things that meant the most to the Dutch East India Company? I found one person, Jan Peterson Kuhn, this really uh, draconian governor yeah. gen- general they had. He was really the only one who made a difference. The others were just carrying out functions ordered from right. Amsterdam. Kern changed it in a worse way, but a more profitable way. And then I found only two places. There were those two straits, the Southern Strait and the Northern Strait in Indonesia, that control of those changed what the Dutch East India Company was about. And then I ended up with uh, the switch from large ocean-going ships to small river-going ships so they could focus on intra-Asian trade. And then what are the other two I'm forgetting? The Probably one of the ones was spices. I don't remember. I haven't read that book in a while now. The fluctuation in in the desire for spices versus other, whether it be coffee or some other thing. Chocolate, uh, tea. Tea. Yeah, Yeah. that's right. Yeah. Which the the British were better able to monopolize. So yeah, the Dutch East India Company was a monopoly primarily on nutmeg and mace, which at the time only grew on a couple of islands in the world. Right. The Dutch not only seized those islands from the natives, they chopped down all nutmeg and mace trees on all other islands 
enslave the local population, jacked the prices way up, and also kept all the other Europeans out of their area using force, including one underhanded massacre of some British. Now, I don't mean to, to demonize the Dutch here. The Dutch have been good to me. I've been a professor there in, <laughs> uh, in Amsterdam. The Dutch were facing their own crisis, which is that they were trying to maintain indep- independence from Spain. Right, right. And to, to afford that, the war against Spain, they needed a, a huge income source with high profits, which was the spice trade. And so in a way, uh, they had to do it for their own survival. I'm not justifying their colonialism, but there were powerful motivations for them to do that for their own survival. And then later the British took over because, mm-hmm. as you just mentioned, chocolate tea and coffee became more important than spice. Also, the French started growing those spices in the Caribbean, undercutting the, the Dutch right. monopoly. So that really, the, the fortunes of the Dutch sank, the fortunes of the British rise, and that's the world we remember. British Empire, not the Dutch Empire. Right. Even though the Dutch Empire lasted after World War II, and even later, Indonesia became independent and Suriname and some other places. And, you know, Britain's empire doesn't exist, but they still have the Commonwealth. And um, that was a fascinating book to research. And you choose that object as a kind of polemic against Leibniz, who uses yes. a kind of an ad absurdum argument with that, well, you know, obviously it's absurd to think of two diamonds glued together or the East India Company as an object or as a, does he say as an object or as a monad, maybe? As a, as a monad, but same yeah. thing for me. Yeah. Of course, of course, I love Leibniz. What I don't like is his distinction between substance and aggregate, because mm-hmm. a lot of the most interesting objects in the world are aggregates. And that includes, you know, organic chemicals that are synthesized in labs and polymers that are made by, by industry and sports franchises, which interest me and, and mm-hmm. nations. I mean, obviously, the United States does not have a monad. It would be an aggregate for Leibniz, just like the two diamonds glued together. It was important to find a way to think of objects that was not infected by Leibniz's naturalism, which comes from Aristotle. The idea that nature decides what's real and not. First of all, there's no such thing as nature. Objects have to produce things through work, just like we have to produce things through work. So I don't believe there's a strong distinction between nature and culture. That comes from Latour. But Latour, like Whitehead, is stronger at talking about aggregates or compound things. What's interesting, too, just to, to move to one of the terms that you you mentioned, um, that object-oriented, whether coincidence or not, comes from computer science, but you also mentioned two of the the enemies you fight against is undermining and overmining. And you also say that they normally come together in duo Mm -hmm. mining. And you say that this, interestingly enough, comes from like credit card companies where they data mine and text mine individuals in order to sort of pinpoint the best way to whether it be market to them or get some kind of consumer information that's valuable. Do you think that then Leibniz is like a classic example of perpetually undermining because it's monads all the way down? Do you want to say a little bit about the dual mining approach that you fight against in Triple O? Sure. The uh, computer science connection is simply, my dad's kind of a computer guy and he had some object-oriented computer tech sitting around the house. I was visiting them from Egypt one summer and I was reading the part about encapsulation, which Mm -hmm. has to do that you, you don't have to see what's making the object work in computer science. It's hidden. And I thought, oh, that's actually a metaphor that works for me. I don't use encapsulation, but I could. And, and so I decided object-oriented philosophy was a metaphor I want to use. I'm not an expert on the computer science aspect of it, but the metaphor, I just steal the metaphor. And uh, people reacted very favorably to that at a conference where I used it in 1999 for the first time. I think it was, I have it in my notes from two years before that. But So I guess it was when I was in Chicago, not Cairo still. But anyway, I came up with undermining and overmining for the second speculative realism conference, Bristol, okay. 2009. That's for the my paper in the speculative turn anthology. That's where mm-hmm. you'll first find undermining and overmining. Dual mining I came up with a few years later because I, I started noticing people tend to overmine and undermine simultaneously. They don't usually mm-hmm. come in isolation. I said, I need a term for that and dual mining will be the obvious one. And let me see if it exists. Because unlike some people, as I mentioned, I don't like coining terms. I like using words that are out there. So I Googled dual mining and an article came up was two guys in data science who talked about data mining and text mining people simultaneously to get as much information out of them as you can. And that's kind of the sinister flavor I wanted. Someone had told me around that time that credit card companies can predict three or four years in advance with 75% accuracy that you're going to get a divorce, even if you don't realize it. Something Something changes about spending habits when couples start drifting apart. I don't know what it is, but this feeds into our current crisis, which is that Facebook can predict what we're going to do next. We are Mm -hmm. not as free as we think. We are creatures of habit and pattern. And it's kind of alarming to know that. They, they can predict which street corner we're going to turn next at on Google Maps. Sometimes it's helpful. I like that Amazon knows what books I like. <laughs> yes. Every time Amazon recommends me a book, it's exactly what I was looking for. And some people hate that. I like that. I don't like it when it gets a little beyond Amazon to which ads I want to watch, things like that. That's the thing about dual mining. Now, the other question was about uh, 
I guess I mentioned that Leibniz seems like a classic underminer where, you know, oh, yeah. where any monad, it's, it's monads all the way down. So, so you're going to have the kind of Simondonian pre-individual or singularities un- undermining any one object, right? That an object can be reduced to its, to some smaller, whether it be atoms, you know, or quarks or, or whatnot. Whereas overmining would be sort of extrapolate extrapolating to its effects on other objects and you kind of want to say that an object is more than it's than whatever undermining constituent you, you may try to replace it with or less than the effects correct yes i would actually call leibniz a dual minor because yes okay there's, there's the side where everything's reduced to monads and you find that in gabriel todd for example the monadology and sociology but then he's also an overminer because what is a monad a monad is a set of relations Right. Okay. That are there due to pre-established harmony. And so Leibniz is like the classic duo miner. And here's how a lot of people can't figure out what you get other than dual mining. What's out there to be had? Here's the simplest way to explain it. We're all still moderns. Modernity will be remembered someday as the age of knowledge. This mm. is the age when the one kind of human cognition that everyone wants is knowledge, as though there were no other kinds. Right. Science rules the age. Science has the ultimate social prestige on everything. And now we're having a backlash against that with anti-vaxxers and stuff. Right. I think that's the wrong kind of reaction to have. There are other, plenty of other kinds of human cognition, one of them being the arts. Mm-hmm. An artwork is not primarily telling you, teaching you about something, right? Mm-hmm. Picasso's Guernica is not a lesson about the Spanish Civil War. That plays some role in it. But an aesthetic experience is not primarily a knowledge lesson. And I started asking myself, How many kinds of knowledge are there? And I realized there are only two. Mm. Someone asks you what something is. You can tell them what it's made of. You can tell them what it does. Those are the only two kinds of knowledge. I've never found a counterexample. And uh, that's what you... Look at Dennett, for example. Dennett's philosophy of mind. All the mind really is, is it's either subpersonal neural components or it's behavior. There's no mystery other than that. It's If you figure out which neurons are firing in somebody's mind brain and figure out how they're behaving, that explains everything you need to know about the mind. And that misses the first person experience, which Dennett would have arguments against, but it misses a lot of stuff, not just in the minds. Right. It misses the fact that I wrote about Eddington's two tables in the third table, my, my mm-hmm. article. Eddington says there are two tables here, the table of practical use that has a color and a weight and a price and a position, and the table of science that's mostly empty space and it's electrons flying around. And he says, those two are irreducible to each other. I, I like the science one because I'm a scientist, but you'll never get rid of the practical one. Well, it occurred to me that neither of those is the real table. Mm-hmm. Because you can't reduce a table to electrons and quarks because it has emergent features and you can remove some of the electrons and quarks. It's still the same table, but neither can you reduce it to its use because it has many possible uses. This was Lingus's argument about why substance and Levinas is so important. Substance precedes function for Levinas. This was his, one of his critiques of the tool analysis at Heidegger, that there's got to be something in between those two. Now, I've just mentioned that both kinds of knowledge don't go between. Both kinds of knowledge go to one extreme or the other. So you need something that's not knowledge to get at the third table. Now, people immediately start screaming negative theology, mysticism, but that's because they're not imaginative enough. Mm, I like that. <laughs> there, there are all kinds of human cognition that are not knowledge. Mm-hmm. Hints, for example, so much human communication takes the form of hint and innuendo, where if you spell something out, you've spoiled it, you've ruined it. It's no longer what it was. This is Aristotle and the enthymeme. Exactly. Threats. Okay, I love threats. I love talking about the godfathers. I'm going to make them an offer you can't refuse. There's no possible concrete threat you can put in place of that that will be worse than I'm going to make him an offer you can't refuse. Like I'm going to cut off his horse's head and put it in his bed, which is what happens. That's one example. Let me tell you an example, a horrible example from recent American history. Which Gulf War was it? I guess it was the 2003 one. When Cheney was vice president, there was worries, trumped up or not, that uh, Iraq was going to use chemical weapons on the American Mm -hmm. soldiers. And uh, Dick Cheney sent a threat to Iraq at that point that, as horrible and brutal as it was, was the best threat ever as a threat. He said, this is to let you know that if Iraq uses chemical weapons on American forces, the United States will respond promptly and decisively in a manner from which it will take Iraq centuries to recover. Now, that is way better than anything he could have said about nuclear weapons. Like, we're going to nuke you if you use chem- That would be stupid and childish. And what he said was not nice. And I don't no. approve it. But yeah. as a threat, it's a work of arts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A manner from which it will take centuries to recover. That's You can't get much worse than that. Okay, so threats are powerful. You know, love letters. Who's going to write a love letter that's literal and say, here's what I plan to do to your body at our next date? (laughs) Yeah, it becomes pornographic. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you reach a certain point in your relationship where that happens, but if it's a new, you're probably not going to have much success with that sort of letter. It's it's kind of a turnoff for many people. So 
poems, right? If you put a poem in a literal form, Cleanth Brooks of the New Critics always talked mm-hmm. about this, the paraphrastic fallacy that paraphrasing a poem doesn't work. A poem yeah. doesn't mean a literal thing. A metaphor doesn't mean a literal thing, as Max Black points out in analytic philosophy. Here's the analogy. You can't take a three-dimensional globe and put it on a two-dimensional map. You can, but you change the size and the shape. Mm-hmm. There's no mathematical way to do it, and there's no way to change a metaphor or an artwork into prose. You ruin it. So imagine a book on Cezanne the painter, but there are no images in it. It's all just prose descriptions of Cezanne's paintings. You're not going to quite get at Cezanne there. You have to have some illustrations. And notice that critics in areas like art, architecture, food critics, movie critics, wine critics have to be poetic and have to be masters of yes. turn, turns of phrase. The Chicago Reader used to have great movie reviews. They did it through sarcasm. In one sentence, they could destroy a movie without a prose description. I remember two in particular. One of them was Cool Runnings. Remember that? that yes. Movie? It began by saying Cool Runnings, and then in parentheses, aka Uncle Tom's bobsled. Oh. Which is vicious, right? It's good. Yeah. <laughs> And then the other one was that first new Star Wars movie, The Phantom Menace. The first sentence of the review was not half bad for a toy commercial, which pretty much destroyed the movie and pretty much summed it up. And uh, you guys may know an essay by Daniel Dennett, who's a hero of the rationalists, right? Daniel Dennett has an essay called Quining Qualia. He's trying to eliminate qualia, right? Sense experience doesn't matter. I've avoided reading Dennett, but I know <laughs> of him. But go yeah, ahead. and we know of him. Turns out he's actually a nice guy. He, you, can have an, okay. you, can, you can have a debate with him, according to uh, the late Francisco Varela, who said... <laughs> You can actually have a debate with Dennett, unlike Marvin Minsky, who's an asshole. <laughs> uh, uh, so he actually liked Dennett as a person. I, I'll take that. I'll take that as true. So Dennett seems he's readable. Yeah, he's, he's clear, but he's, yes. he's, make, he's making fun of wine tasters in that essay. He's saying, "I remember uh, this." Yeah, I remember this. Okay, go ahead. He says, "Ah, uh, oh, flamboyance and velvety pinot, but lacking in stamina." Yeah, and he says, "What a bunch of crap! Just pour it in a machine and analyze the chemical formula. That's real wine tasting." But that's not real wine tasting. We need to hear the flamboyance and velvety pinover leggings. And yes, some of it might be pretentious garbage, just like some poetry is pretentious garbage, just like some of Heidegger's forays into poetic language are pretentious garbage or precious or pompous. But that doesn't inculpate the entirety of poetry and non-literal language. There's also Shakespeare out there, people. There are also amazing art critics out there. Clement Greenberg was talking about a French artist in one of his reviews and referred to the essentially confectionary nature of this man's art. (laughs) And... It destroys it. It looks like candy. It's all bright yeah. colors and it couldn't have criticized the art in literal terms better than that. So knowing how to write non-literally, this is the problem analytic philosophy has. They think that writing clear is enough, that continental philosophers are fuzzy. Right. And they don't say what they mean. We're all clear and say what we mean, but it's boring writing. They yeah. don't have many good writers. Got to have a little jouissance, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And Hegel's a difficult writer, but he's a great writer. He has amazing images. Plato, Nietzsche, Bergson's a wonderful writer. Uh, Ortega Gasset should have won a Nobel Prize for literature. Latour is extremely funny in a way that analytic philosophers are corny usually when they try to make jokes. Right. Uh, Latour is actually very funny. In fact, Harald de Vries was the main Dutch Latourian. I asked him once, what drew you to Latour? And he said he was funny. No other philosophers were funny. Yeah. So all these kinds of things, cracking jokes, insinuations, rhetorical flourishes that you find in Nietzsche. If you try to literalize Nietzsche, he becomes stupid in a way. Go to an encyclopedia article that summarizes Nietzsche. Like Nietzsche believed there should be a Superman who was beyond current humans, and he opposed socialism and Christianity. Okay, yeah, but anybody could, that could describe anybody. Mm-hmm. But not all those people are Nietzsche. They're not as interesting as Nietzsche. It's any right winger could fit that description, but none of yeah. them write like Nietzsche. Yeah. You have to analyze Nietzsche's style and how, how he says stuff. And people say, oh, that's just ornamentation. No, it's not. Rhetoric no. is very important. Our age undervalues rhetoric. Our age treats rhetoric as mere rhetoric. Go back to the Romans and the Greeks, and you'll see how to appreciate rhetoric. Go read speeches by Cicero or Demosthenes. Those things are incredible. Go back and read the U.S. Senate in the 19th century. People like Daniel Webster. Let us imitate the prudence of the mariner in this situation. Take <laughs> stock. Compared to now, it's just it's a, it's a tragedy how our politicians speak compared to mm-hmm. the last century. So um, rhetoric is very important, and rhetoric is very close to philosophy. I know Plato hates rhetoricians. Aristotle did not. Aristotle taught his students rhetoric half the day, and there's a reason for that. And it's not just because, well, there are corrupt people and you have to beat them in arguments sometimes. It's that you can't make everything literal. That's why rhetoric's important to him. That's why metaphor is important for him. He says mm-hmm. metaphor is the greatest human gift. It comes down to non-literality. So what's triple O? Triple O is an opposition to literalism in philosophy. Mm-hmm. And anytime you try to scientize philosophy, turn philosophy into prose, you're missing the philosophia part, the philosophia part, I mm-hmm. should say, the love of wisdom. Socrates never gives a successful definition, ever. He's not a man of science. And even science is falsifiable. It's fallible. So even science has to be rethought in terms of philosophia. 
All right, I got on a tangent there. But. No, no, I, I love all this because it because it does cut into some of the other questions, many of which I could bring up. You indicated why Socrates is a key figure in your your writing, this this notion that he never that we should take him seriously when he whenever he claims not to have knowledge, we should take this seriously and not a mere self-deprecation or some sort of vulgar joke, right? Because as you say, philosophy can't be knowledge or can't try to imitate science, for example, which is a current that we still see. And I guess that what I really liked on your weird realism book on Lovecraft was your focus on his style and not necessarily the content, right? The Which if you focus on Lovecraft's content, it's easy to make the case dismissively that he's a pulp fiction writer. But by focusing on the style, you come up with this term that I really like, this notion of ruination, that there right. are ways to ruin a writer. And the more ways there are, perhaps that is a almost a metric of how great of a, of a stylistic writer they are. I mean, is this notion of, of ruination, obviously literalizing and literalism is one of the ways to ruin a writer, but you come up with some other ones that may be related to it, for example, playing the pedant or or some other circumlocuitous way, but it does seem to that the hard kernel is this way of literalizing that which literalizing either a joke or a poem or a style like Nietzsche is what is the best way to kill it, is the best way to ruin it. Right. I remember uh, being at the Heidegger Circle at Vanderbilt in 1991, and a Deridian was there. It was a conversation about graduate students. And there was an analytic philosophy graduate student and a Derridian graduate student. And the analytic oh philosophy student asked the Derridian to explain why Derrida is important. And she explained it. And the analytic philosopher's response was, so basically, Derrida thinks we should be very, very careful, which is kind of funny. Yeah. All he's doing, it's not fair. He's literalizing, reducing all of Derrida's work to one literal statement. Be very careful when you're reading somebody, which mm-hmm. of course makes it sound ridiculous, right? And you, yeah. But you can do that to any philosopher. You can do that to Quine. You can do that mm-hmm. to... To done it. You can do that too. Um, you know, as you pointed out in my Lovecraft book, near the beginning, I talk about Edmund Wilson's mockery of Lovecraft. I love Edmund yeah. Wilson, his literary critic, but he says, what does he say? Lovecraft's stories assume an outlandish group of prehistoric creatures who play tricks with time and space, usually somewhere in Massachusetts, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it sound stupid, right? Yeah. And so then I go on and ruin Melville and Dante that way by doing the mm-hmm. same thing. And so see, and they're obviously great writers. And then in my, my, um, architecture and objects book there's a guy fred Sharman, who I, I have a friendly relationship with on twitter who was doing that about architecture was making fun of me too he he said stuff like um derrida likes difference so let's make uh, let's make buildings that are disconcerting let uh, graham Harmon <laughs> like withdrawal so let's make variable buildings with mysterious outlines he's trying to make fun of all philosophical influence on architecture then i pointed out that you could do that even with architects right i would say uh Le Corbusier likes flexibility, so let's make extensive use of the free plan. Literalizing anything makes it stupid, makes it yeah. sound stupid. But the point is, things are not literalizable. You can make a cheap joke like that, but it's you're not getting the thing right. Lovecraft, yes, you can make fun of Lovecraft by talking about an invisible whistling octopus. That's another way of yeah. So, But yeah, okay, saying that Lovecraft writes about an invisible whistling octopus isn't really capturing what Lovecraft is about when you read him. No. Yeah. Literalism is our enemy. Not that we should abolish it. You need literalism. Knowledge is necessary for the survival of the human species. I was going to say, literalism can be circumscribed for you, right, to yeah. to the role of knowledge. Sure, and it's good. It's good that we can undermine the morning star and the evening star and say there's mm-hmm. just one planet, Venus. Mm-hmm. Or it's good that we can overmine witches and say there is no such thing as a witch. There's just a bunch of random coincidences that you, ignorant person, are saying were caused by a witch. <laughs> so, so undermining and overmining are debunking tools. Knowledge is about debunking. It's about Here's the other mm-hmm. thing. Knowledge isn't about truth. Knowledge is about justification. Yes. And I'll give you a good reason for why. Poll most scientists, and 98% of the, I don't know if this is true, but let's say 98% of the scientists are atheists. Well, look, these scientists have no better idea than any of us what happens after you die. No one has the slightest clue what happens after you die. It's just that there's no justification in their eyes for saying Mm -hmm. that God exists. Okay, but that's that's a question of justification. Kierkegaard would fight back and say, look, you've got to make a choice. Are you going to be a Christian or not? There's never going to be enough justification. So justification, i.e. knowledge, is never going to be the full picture. You have to make certain choices. Sometimes there's going to be ambiguous evidence for whether something's true or not. Mm -hmm. I get mad at anti-science people who don't want to take vaccines and things like that, but there are some things about COVID that I don't know. There might be things the medical authorities are wrong about. So it's a tightrope you have to walk. I've had people tell me it's stupid to think that aliens exist because of some mathematical thing about what the chances are we would have seen them by now. That seems to have been extended way too far. We really have no idea whether they're aliens. 
I think it's probably, I think we probably do out there. So you have to be careful about mistaking justification for truth. And this comes down to the fallibilism of science, which you get not only from Popper, but also from Lakatos, somebody I like even more. Mm. This idea that we're not committed to truth because we never know the truth. Science is fallible. Popper thinks we are committed to what hasn't been falsified. But then Lakatos points out every scientific theory has already been falsified. There's falsifying evidence for every scientific paradigm that has ever existed and ever exists today. He says before Einstein, there were like 200 and some falsifications of Newton already. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But there wasn't a better theory because Mm -hmm. Newton works so well. You got to stick with Newton. And Einstein's has plenty of falsifications now. It doesn't fit with quantum theory. Mm -hmm. That's a huge falsification. But do you have a better theory of gravity than Einstein? If not, we're going to stick with Einstein. (laughs) Yeah. Science is not what people often think it is. And it's ultimately about justification. What does the evidence tell us? But the evidence is always going to change. And so this is one of my big objections to Brassier's standpoint. Brassier says, for example, we all know we're going to die. And with equal justice, we all know that the universe is going to burn out and and there will be nothing left. No, that's not equal justice. The justification for knowing that we're going to die is that human history has never recorded a person who hasn't died. The justification for the universe burning out and we're all already dead, therefore, is that a cosmology that's a few centuries old, that's really in its infancy. So why should I think my life is worthless just because a couple centuries old cosmology tells me that there's going to be no trace of human civilization at some point? No, that's too remote for me. It's an interesting scientific speculation, but I'm not going to ground my life in it. It's much too remote. So there's a big difference. I have to ground my life in the fact that I'm mortal. I don't have to ground it in the fact that the universe is going to disappear in a puff of smoke. There's a big difference between those two. So that's, that's where I would, not all scientific statements are on the same footing, in other words. It's not a flat science. It has to do with a degree of justification. That's how much you, you accept a scientific theory. What's the degree of justification? There are problems with Darwin's paradigm, and we still have Darwinists out there. Maybe it's better than creationism, but it's not necessarily better than Margulis's theory or Eldridge and Gould's theory. So there's still room for debate. Dawkins is not necessarily right. <laughs> this is interesting. It comes down to you, you locate knowledge, the role of knowledge as what you call justified untrue belief. Right. Because as you said, science isn't really uh, interested in truth. And to a certain degree, you want to divorce knowledge from truth. Is there a role at all for truth that's not metaphorical in triple O? Because I kind of, I have a, a lot of I guess, let's say, I kind of follow Leotard when he says some of the same things about science doesn't care about truth, it cares about effects. Is truth merely a kind of, uh, is it something like the love of wisdom where we can't have truth, but we can can sort of love it in in this elusive way? I guess that, that would be my question. Well, for people who are against my philosophy, I would first point out that it's not that different from Badiou's events and the fidelity of the subject, right? That Mm -hmm. ultimately you have to wager on an event and that's one side of Badiou that I like. The real ex Badiouians often like the being side and not the event side. I like the event side better. I like the event side too, yeah. You do, okay. Yeah. And uh, also his concept of anti-philosophy, I think, is very powerful. The idea that every philosophy has kind of anti-philosophical core, where you're you're committing yourself to something. You've got Nietzsche and Pascal and... You've got an Wittgenstein and yeah. Right, yeah. And uh, uh, ultimately St. Paul. Well, yeah, I think what's underdetermined in Badiou's philosophy is how to distinguish between good fidelities and bad fidelities. Mm. He does talk about pseudo events somewhere, but he never really theorizes that. You know, Heidegger thought Hitler was an event. I would call that a pseudo event, but how do you go about distinguishing the difference? It's not something he spends a lot of time on. He kind of assumes that, look, anyone with a brain can see that communism is the political event to stake your, your life on. Well, maybe for him and his circle, that's true, but it's not so convincing for everyone else. Right. Uh, does a light go off in your head when you encounter communism and say, this must be true. And if you somehow don't agree, it's a moral failing on your part. So, that's underdeveloped in him. Also, when there are two paradigms fighting, how do you right. determine which one is the event and which one isn't? So that's what I like about Badiou anyway. I just wish he develops it a bit more. I think any honest philosopher of science, though, is going to tell you that science is a justified untrue belief, because otherwise you're not a fallibilist. Right. If, you're, if you're not a fallibilist, what are you committed to? You're committed to something like Carnap, where there's, you know, there's a direct induction from facts, which mm-hmm. is a problem never been solved. How can you do that? How can you induce a law from isolated facts. You can do what the structural realists do and say that even when paradigms change in science, a certain mathematical core remains preserved. But I smell bullshit there because, yeah, you could say Newton's equations still work for most cases, right? But they're false. Einstein's equations, we can say right now, are justified. 
Newtons are not. Einstein's equations work in a way that Newtons simply don't. Yeah, you can artificially limit yourself to a small number of cases, but then it's not a valid equation. It was valid from whenever the Principia was published up until the general theory of relativity Mm -hmm. was verified by Eddington. So scientists know this. The great scientists know that they're followers. They're followers. And yet people want to make science an authority. It's a political thing that people are into. Yes. Science about maximal authority. Why are we making it an authority question? Now, granted, I, I want to use some public authority against people who are, are not masking and going into places where I am. So there may be a role for that. But to say that science is going to police how people have to think may be a bit better than fundamentalist religion, but it's the same kind of structure in the end. Yeah. Yep, the, only, the only way it's not is if it's fallible. You know, fundamentalist religion is not usually fallible. There's a holy text that is incontrovertible. If you don't have that element in science, then it's not different. And so you need fallibilism. You need to be able to say, oh, Dennett is completely wrong. Consciousness is not just dual mineable. There is something in between. I need to at least be able to make that case. You can't tell me to shut up or you're not, you're not doing science. This is good because it, 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 it provides you ammunition for the extended claim that there is no political knowledge. Right. And exactly. because that, that would be that would get us back into what Lacan would call like the university discourse, which is really about sort of providing a shield uh, for power by saying, no, 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 this is objective fact. This, these are the facts speaking. This is why things are the way they are. And and this is why authority is infallible. And, right. and that that itself is problematic. And so if you think that there's political knowledge, that's ultimately a moral position, because if you ask if there's political knowledge, then why do we have so many political disagreements? And you end up having to say because of corrupt class interests or evil people who want to exploit others, which I doubt that's what's going on in the mind of Jeff Bezos. How can I exploit others? He's probably failing to see something. To call Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk evil doesn't quite do it for me. We may choose to censure them for a number of reasons, but there's something more complicated going on there with why they're doing what they're doing. And so you need to open the, the way for political experiments that we don't really know what the best political system is. And I haven't read David Graeber's new book on world history yet, but I did read the article a few years ago that was paving mm. the way for that. And I loved his idea of political experimentation. Mm. We shouldn't just accept Rousseau's story about what happened with agriculture and metallurgy, that people were experimenting with different political forms. And then Latour, of course, also wants experimental politics because nobody really knows what works and what doesn't. Politics. Dewey says something about that. The other thing we don't get in modern political theory is the role of non-human objects enough. You basically have the left, which thinks humans are naturally good and society ruined us, or the right, which thinks humans are naturally evil and society is holding us in check. But what if humans were never the stuff of politics to begin with? What if objects are really the stuff of politics? And this comes out of Latour's work with Shirley Strom, the primatologist at UC San Diego. They studied Hmm. baboons, and they found out that baboons are more, more social than humans. Baboons are constantly watching each other, trying to look at the rank order and which baboons on top today. Humans don't do that. When I wake up in the morning, I know my credit card debt. I know my bank account amount. I know I'm distinguished professor of philosophy at SciArc. I know who my wife is. I know where I work. Where I work. I know where I live. I know when the voting day is. I know what my passport is. So I don't have to have a crisis every time somebody insults me on the street, or I don't have to think my whole identity is crumbling the way a baboon does if it loses a fight, because there's all these objects that stabilize my position. It's my car. It's my money. It's my apartment. And that's not all bad, right? It's not all that we're greedy capitalists hoarding stuff and not sharing it. It's also Mm -hmm. that certain objects do stabilize our identity. Don't come in and steal all my clothes out of my closet. That's who I am. Don't come steal my (laughs) Don't pretend to be Graham Harmon and take my social security. That's identity theft. Don't steal my wife, right? (laughs) Because we want stable lives. We like waking up basically knowing most days who we are, where we fit in the cosmos, and we wouldn't want to be in constant crisis about that. Yes. So it's not all bad. And so objects play a good role in that sense. Yeah, they can also stabilize bad systems. But we need to look at the role objects play for good and ill in politics and not just obsess over whether human nature is good or bad, right? And not just assume that anyone who has more objects is exploiting everybody. Tell a more complicated story about how that happens. So this is why I, as much as I always cheer for left positions against right positions, I've never been able quite to sign up with the left in politics because... It seems too closely linked to modern philosophy to me. It seems too closely linked to Hegel and Marx, Mm -hmm. who have plenty of insights, but they are still modern philosophers. They have a subject-object dualism, and they they don't take account of object-object relations. Mm -hmm. And so why would I sign up for a politics that's grounded on a philosophy that I think I tend to get involved in politics on an ad hoc basis and say, Mm. wow, it really sucks that those coffee farmers are being exploited. I'm not in favor of that. So I'll come in on individual issues without necessarily enlisting in the whole thing that the entire society needs to be overthrown and we start from scratch, because that could suck too. I saw an attempt at that in Egypt 
And it led mm-hmm. to a, it led mm-hmm. to a worse, worse situation than they had before. They just got a worse dictator than Mubarak, I'm sorry to say. Much as I supported the revolution, it backfires. And that comes back to if there were political knowledge, then there would be a way to foresee after the event, the, right. the you know, of, of, of a revolution and whether it would fail or not and these other things. Graham, I, all of this is really great. And we've had, we, we're reaching about the two hour mark. And right. so I know uh, we had a lot more questions, but I just wanted to, uh, uh, Coop, if you could go down to the, the bottom of the document. I wanted to, to say what I found and I know we won't be able to go through all of these, but in your discussion with Manuel Delanda in, in The Rise of Realism, you, was it Lee Breaker? Is that? Braver, uh, Braver. Braver. Apologies. You sort of lay out nine criteria. I assume seven of which were from Braver and two. Six. The, six. Okay. The two I want, the two that I wanted to really focus on, because I, this is one of the reasons why I find Triple O compelling is one and seven, right? One is, the world is not, is dependent on the mind. Now this, obviously you and Delanda both take the realist position that the world is mind independent. And this gets us kind of back to the birth of modern philosophy, if not with Descartes, at least with Kant. Do you want to say either, I mean, I'm not asking you to repiculate your arguments on this, but do you want to say perhaps the moment that, that this crystallized for you, because you take very important at least two very important things from Husserl, right? But Husserl would fall on the anti-realist side, for example, right. whereas Heidegger might fall on the realist side. Do you want to um, say when or, or how this crystallized as a major pressing issue? Yeah, it happened when, uh, I don't remember how I got a copy of Braver's book. I think it was from Evan Selinger. I think he sent it to me and wanted me to review it for I think Human Studies, where he was the book review editor, they ended up not taking it because they thought it didn't fit the interest of their readers. So I put it in Philosophy, to- <sighs> Philosophy Today instead, the Paul Based Journal. And I really liked Braver's book. I disagree with the conclusion. His conclusion is that continental philosophy is anti-realist, and that's great. I think it's not great, but I think he's right. <laughs> yeah. I think continental philosophy is anti-realism. And what Taylor was referencing here is that there's a, a chart early in Braver's book where he lists a pair of R1, A1, R2, A2 theses. These are six pairs of opposed realist and anti-realist theses. And when people say realism or anti-realism, that realism, they could mean any of those six, according mm-hmm. to Braver. And so you have to be careful that you know what you're dealing with when you respond to a realist or an anti-realist charge. It can mean different things. Taylor mentioned R1A1, which is that the world is either dependent or not dependent on the minds. And as you mentioned, of course, Delanda and I are realists. We'll say the world is not dependent on the minds. The problem is that a lot of people who are actually idealists will say, this is a straw man. I'm not saying the world is dependent on the mind. Because Heidegger will say, we're always already thrown into the world. It's not dependent on us. Or Husserl will say, I'm not saying we create the world. I'm just saying we intend the world. We're always already Mm -hmm. intending objects. But for me, that's why R7A7, which does not appear in Braver, is the key to idealism. And R7A7, which I came up with myself, is the relation of the human subject with the world is not or is a privileged relation for philosophy. Now, here's why that's important. Kant's, obviously, is the turning point in modern philosophy in many ways. Mayasu and I both disagree with Kant, but for totally different reasons. Right. Mayasu doesn't like the finitude of Kant. Mayasu thinks we can have absolute knowledge through mathematical means. So he's against the finitude. He thinks Kant ruined philosophy because of the finitude. And look at all the bad degenerate forms of finitude that occur in 20th century philosophy. I say finitude's inescapable because the relation we have to a thing to know it is never going to be the same as the thing in itself. There's always right. going to be a, a difference, a minimal difference in translation. What's wrong with Kant, I said, is the one that nobody ever talks about, which is the fact that Kant won't let you talk about object-object relations. You get to talk about human object relations. And if I mm-hmm. want to talk about fire burning cotton, as Islamic philosophy did, what I'm really talking about is how the fire cotton relation appears to the human understanding, right? according to space, time, and the 12 categories. I can't talk about fire cotton because I can't see it without being human. That is the central assumption of present-day philosophy, analytic and continental, for everyone except Whitehead and someone close to him, I think. Uh, Because Whitehead goes back and say, hey, let's be pre-Kantians on this point. All relations are equal. The relation between any two things is the same as a relation to to relation between mind and worlds. Now, here's what happens in practice, though. In modern philosophy, this turns into a division of labor. Because, of course, we still talk about object-object relations. It's just that we let science do it. Oh, science is so great. It's so successful. They already tell us what happens when fire burns cotton. Philosophy talks about the thought world relation. That's what we're supposed to talk about. That's our little pale, right? That's our kingdom. 
we're not going to talk. Science is so great. Let's flatter science some more so that they'll know we're not trampling on them and being irrational. But then what happens, of course, is that some philosophers disobey that and try to socially construct all of nature. Mm-hmm. And then some scientists disobey it by coming and explaining the thought world relation by neurons. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Wolf Singer, who was talking to Metzinger in his book, The Ego Tunnel, says, but don't worry, we still need philosophers for ethics panels, right? You guys will still need to make ethical decisions. So you're not mm-hmm. going to be fired. That's a very meager version of what philosophy can do, because mm-hmm. philosophy can talk about all object-object relations. Philosoph- science does do a great job with object-object relations, but it's object-object relations thematized in one narrow specific way, in terms of spatial temporal impacts, motions that can be put into equations. Chemical not- composition. Yeah. Undermining and overmining. Mm-hmm. And stuff. They're not going to tell you anything. Even Bertrand Russell said this, that science gives you the relational properties of things. It doesn't give you the inherent properties of things. So I'm with Bertrand Russell of all people on this. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Usually an analytic hero. Okay. So there was a question before this that led to, oh yeah, we're talking about braver. I think the key, the key to knowing that you're really past Kant is that you're treating any relation between any two entities in the same way that you're treating thought world relations. And now people will say that's nonsense. Because the thought world relation is an epistemological one. You can't make that an ontological one between beings. My response to that is this, who invented this distinction between epistemology and ontology? What gives that the right to exist? When I decide that I am finite, if I am Immanuel Kant and say, you know, we humans are finites, that's not something I figure out because I'm human. It's something I get by deducing that, hey, I'm perceiving a bunch of stuff, but I could be perceiving a bunch of other stuff if I could Mm -hmm. see 10 dimensions or didn't see causation. So therefore, I must be finite. That's a logical deduction that I'm making. It's not, I'm not seeing my finitude. I'm seeing the world that appears to me. The finitude is another step. Likewise, I can say, hey, the fire burning is burning the cotton, but the, there's all these properties of the cotton that the fire can't interact with. So really, the fire and cotton are, are finite as well. That's the same deduction as I make with the thought right. of the world. Now, people get worried about this because all of modern philosophy is going to fall apart if you accept that change. And they're going to think you're a panpsychist, which sounds like a crackpot theory. No, it's going to end up a little more in the, like what Whitehead is, except that Whitehead relationizes everything. This is going to be a Whitehead with substances that are irreducible to their relations. And also, I have, unlike Whitehead, an object quality distinction within objects, whereas Whitehead's working in the bundle of qualities tradition of British empiricism, which influenced him a lot. Every time one quality changes of a thing, it's a new thing. So Triple O is really the non-relational philosophy of substance that thinks an object is at odds with itself as well. It doesn't have a clear relation with its own qualities. That's the easiest way to summarize Triple O. And it is being applied in many disciplines. Immaterialism is one way. The arts, architecture, and I'm working on, a, I'm co-authoring a book with an archaeologist now, Christopher Whitmore at Texas Tech. We're talking about the implications for archaeology, and he's a real classicist, so he can guide me through that field. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, organization studies. Organization studies at the University of Leicester had a day-long conference on Dante's Broken Hammer. I don't know what they've done with it lately, but every field deals with objects and relations. Every field. There isn't one that doesn't. And how much of the object is relational, how much of it is integral. Every single field deals with that property, with, sorry, that problem. The problem is they've all adopted these kinds of half-hearted postmodern solutions where a thing mm-hmm. just is its relations. Foucault is the, what do I call it, default reference of everyone in the humanities and social sciences. I don't know if you've ever checked the citations. Derrida has around 300,000 citations, which is a hell of a lot. Zizek and Latour, 200, 100, something. Foucault but, has the most, if I'm not mistaken, among the humanities by far. Over a million, three times more than Derrida. And it's because every field uses Foucault. Mm-hmm. History. And, and so Foucault is the default authority. You're going to find Foucaultian ontology at the bottom of almost any standard humanities or social science project these days. And it's, it's fine. There's a lot of good stuff about Foucault. He's a really, really smart guy. Read his interviews. Mm-hmm. But what if that were to switch to Latour, for example, which people were toying with that idea for a while, because for Latour, inanimate objects come into the picture, and that would change a lot of stuff. People sometimes say they don't like Latour because he's a neoliberal. He's not. Latour is a harsh critic of economics. He's a liberal. Mm -hmm. Latour believes in elections and parliaments and things, but he's not a neoliberal economically. And Foucault, you know, hard leftists don't like Foucault's politics either. It's too pragmatic. Remember what he said to Chomsky in the debate when Chomsky said the best form of human society would be whatever. And Foucault said, Chomsky is more advanced than I am. I don't know what the best form of human society is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like, I like that answer. Pragmatic. Yeah, that's a great answer. And Foucault didn't want to be an activist unless he knew he could make a difference on different issues. Anyway, mm-hmm. Foucault is kind of the standard post-Kantian ontological framework for interdisciplinary work related to philosophy. And that's fine. There could be a lot worse people than Foucault. But I, <laughs> I think there's some limitations to Foucault's position. And he's mm-hmm. not, somebody, not somebody I've written about, but I should probably at some point talk about a post Foucaultian position in humanities and social sciences. Okay. Have I said everything you wanted to about Braver? <laughs> what I found interesting was 
working through the nine points. At first, before you guys went into two through six, I was confused why the realism would be, for example, truth is correspondence, or there Mm -hmm. is one true complete description of how the world is. Right. But with each of these, you say how the anti-realist, and I guess that's, is that how Braver puts it? Yes. And see, that confused me because I would take it the other way around, right? That you know, for a realist, I don't know how truth would be correspondence, at least as uh-huh. you convincingly laid out because of the way not only that objects withdraw from us, but they withdraw from each other's and they are in conflict with their own qualities. So what would be corresponding? Also, I too, as I said, with, with Leotard and, uh, and others, and this is probably my Nietzschean background too, I, I'm very suspect about truth, right? right. As uh, I guess that um, the last thing I would say about all of this because I we, we don't have time to go through the nine, but uh, I did find the your R7 that why should the human world relationship be privileged? Why should 50% of our philosophy be reduced to the humans? And you you make it clear that humans are also objects in your understanding, and we should if we if we are able to get past this is me speaking, but I would say if we're able to get past the kind of anthropocentric, I'm not going to say virtue signaling, but but our a way of aggrandizing ourselves where we like to say, no, I'm I'm a subject, whatever that means, rather than an object. I, you know, I, if, if we can get rid of the notion that somehow thinking of ourselves as objects doesn't dehumanize us, but at least allows for a kind of equality among ontologically, right? Because mm-hmm. we're not talking necessarily talking about ethics, like In ethics, if I am just an object, then we end up back with Kant where I'm a means rather than an end, et cetera. If we can get rid of that prejudice, that fear, then perhaps there would be a way to move past a human-centric privileging in philosophy. Is that kind of your your understanding? Yes. And I'm glad I convinced you that correspondence isn't a good match for realism because most realists assume they go hand in hand. Michael Zevitt, the analytic philosopher, says any realism that doesn't believe in a correspondence theory of truth is a fig leaf realism because hmm. it doesn't let you say anything about the real. But again, he assumes that only direct statements about the real are possible, yes. not indirect ones. As far as the other items in the list, Delanda added eight and nine. The big difference between me and Delanda, I love Delanda. He's a cool dude. Whenever I go to New York, I, I look him up and we have a coffee or something. He is still more of the persuasion that science is a privileged reference to reality. And so, for example, Delanda is not fond of Latour. He's not fond of Karen Barad because they bring society into science, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm a lot closer to Latour than I am to Karen Barad, but I get a lot out of both of them because for me, science is not a privileged relation as it is for Delanda. It's one of many that get us access to the world. As far as the, what you said about the mind and reality, one of the big problems that modern philosophies, by which I mean any subject-oriented philosophies, mm-hmm. not object-oriented philosophies, subject-oriented philosophies, the human subject is something very special ontologically, yes. something different in kind from everything else. And that's convincing to people because that's the era we live in. We tend to think of human thought as being very, very special, even though just look at the universe, we're this tiny minor species compared right. to this cosmos, right? Well, so then these kinds of philosophies have a major problem right at the core, which is what's the relation between these two? Did God create these subjects? Well, no one wants to say that, right? So right. somehow that that subject emerged out of the kingdom of objects. How did that happen? And you get Zizek saying there must have been an ontological catastrophe. Yes. Or um, what else? That people invent all these other ingenious mechanisms. Now, it is a problem. It is a problem how you get consciousness out of physical stuff. And I think it is. I don't think panpsychism is a sufficient answer. But the difference is that in object-oriented ontology, that problem is not right there at the core of the philosophy. It's one problem among many. It's, there are also problems like how did the backbone evolve in creatures, or why did why did such and such happen? Why how do quantum theory and relativity fit together? Those are equally big problems for me. I don't think the relation between thoughts and inanimate matter is any special ontological problem. It's one among many. And so the biggest warts in all of modern philosophy, it's simply removed by Triple O and put to the side. Yes, we need to answer this, but it's not the center of the whole philosophy. Whereas Zizek always has to find new ways to address this. Mm. Oh, it's parallax, right? It's parallax. Mm. It's both, or it's the catastrophe, or it's, um, you know, he's got even more ingenious ones. It has to do with a quantum fluctuation. It's less than nothing. And and they become increasingly less plausible over time, because I think it's an insoluble problem in the terms in which modern philosophy has put it. So uh, we'll see where things are going. Something's going to happen. And I like the chances of where triple O is going to be once people realize that this unique privilege gap between thought and world is not sustainable intellectually. Mm. I think that that's a, uh... 
it, it leaves a, a lot of food for thought and it and your discussion with Delanda just it makes sense why science would be privileged for him insofar as I believe he's trying to give Deleuze a footing that that kind of rescues him from a little bit of the obscurity, whether it be reducing him to a kind of schizophrenic creativity or whether it be the Simondonian foil, right, of privileging the pre-individual, these kind of things, or in, even in difference of repetition where the object would be the explicated solution to an implicated problem and ontologically would not be as, as privileged or would be almost like an accident in a bad sense, whereas there's, you know, and I guess that that's what I find interesting and what I would do, whether or not it would work, would be to, on this score, think through the way in which you deprioritize a lot of different hierarchies, almost, I don't know if the word works, but in a kind of egalitarian ontology based on objects, if that could be, I'm not going to say synthesized, but brought into mm -hmm. relief in a communication with the Liz's fidelity to university and right. where that's kind of where I would go. Now, obviously there would be differences and that's, that's okay, but there could be a productive dialogue going on there. Right. And that was one of the things that I didn't really see Delanda go into maybe because university is, has the stench of metaphysics that he may want to discard. And I know that you don't, think that metaphysics is a naughty word, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was something that I was looking for from Delanda, but mm -hmm. of course he, he feels safer arguing from a position of science for his own reasons, not to, again, not to disregard that, you know, when discussing his Deleuzean framework uh, with you. Right. But that, that would be where I would go, would be to go more metaphysical rather than to go more physical as Delanda tries to do and as he's well-versed in doing. Okay. I was going to respond in a way that ties this back to Baudrillard. Good. Oh, which, oh all right. Perfect ending. <laughs> Deleuze. Okay. I, I, I really like Delanda's intensive science and virtual philosophy. That's, that's the first thing of his I read, and that made me write to him and become a friend of his because I, I was very impressed by that book. But I want to remind Deleuze, Deleuzeans who may be sensitive to criticism that Deleuze has already come a very long way. I mean, you, you have, he's, you've got people left and right calling Deleuze one of the greatest philosophers of all time. You've got Adrian Moore, an analytic philosopher in his history of modern metaphysics, including Deleuze and calling him maybe one of the most creative philosophers ever. And if I remember what Deleuze was when I started graduate school, and I can tell you this because it was fall 1990, it was my first graduate seminar. It was uh, Alfonso Lingus. And the reading list, we didn't do Pierre Bourdieu, who was on the reading list. We ended up doing three philosophers, Baudrillard, Deleuze, Guattari, Antioedipus, and uh, Michel Serre. And at that time, that the other faculty were kind of snickering at that class a bit, as though these are not serious. The serious thinkers are Derrida and Foucault in the continental tradition. Right. Deleuze, like Baudrillard, was kind of a funny but frivolous <laughs> person on the periphery of, of French philosophy. And Michel Serre was kind of this obscure person. I heard a, a Derrida person making fun of Michel Serre once as proof that a certain press was ridiculous for publishing him. I couldn't believe that. So anyway, Baudrillard and, and, and Antioedipus in that class... Deleuze has come a long way since 1990 because it was in the mid-1990s. Maybe people were just sick of Derrida and Foucault at that point, and Deleuze became kind of the cool new reference in the mid-90s. Yes. It happened about three years earlier in architecture, I've since discovered. 1993 is when it started in architecture uh, because of backlash against deconstructivist architecture started gotcha. earlier than... And that was a guy named Greg Lynn at UCLA who was, was one of the main people who did that. But anyway, to get to Baudrillard, who was the other author in that class, he was the first one we read. He's the, literally the first author I read in graduate school. Never read him before. And he really blew me away the first night. Yeah. Really blew me away. And it was a couple of things. One, it was his, uh, his writing style, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. His respect for the object. His attempt to transfer subject-oriented questions into object-oriented questions. That's forgotten about him. Because he's so identified with simulacra, nothing's real, the Gulf War right. was, was an illusion. Yes, but he has objects within the realm of simulation. The object seduces us. And so the object has power over the subject. So he was a big, I've only written a couple of articles on him, I think, but there's a huge amount of Baudrillard in the back of my brain shaping oh, nice. the directions I go in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's, a, he's aged surprisingly well. People thought yes. the trendy person is going to fall by the way. No, he's becoming more relevant all the time. So I think he's got a pretty good future. And it's, it's similar to Husserl for me in the sense that Husserl is about how the object, the sensual object is in tension with its own qualities. Baudrillard is more about how the sensual object draws us in. Right. Yeah. Commands our interest, but they're working the same field. Otherwise, I'm sure the phrase Baudrillard and Husserl has never been uttered until now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Incredible. And just just as a as a parting salvo, I uh, I've always struggled with Husserl. 
Okay. And reading tool being reading your, how much you got out of intentionality, this question about, you know, the object can't be reduced to its adumbrations, the notion of idos, all of this, I think has given me a little bit more confidence to read more uh, of his work. Cause he's always been a stumbling block for me. And it could be the anti-realism. It could be because one of my first philosophy professors was a Husserl professor. And, and so wow. I have some sort of, <laughs> some sort of blockage there, but uh, you continually pointing out what you take from Husserl and what's important and what you also reject. I think that that was something that um, opened up new avenues for me. So even, even just on that tiny little score, I'm, I'm very, that alone made reading your, your work, you know, impactful for me. Although that wasn't the only thing I took away from it. So oh, great. I'm going to end with a final analogy. Which Good. Is that, uh, Husserl is the Frank Lloyd Wright of philosophy. And I want to explain what I mean by that. Husserl is very important. He's not at the cutting edge and present day continental discourse. He's seen as kind of antiquated. Mm -hmm. They're actually having kind of a moment now because philosophy of mind, even analytic philosophy of mind has picked up phenomenology. So they're, they're doing well. Mm -hmm. Philosophically, it's not really at the cutting edge, but it's very important. And when I got into the architecture world, I discovered no one ever talks about Frank Lloyd Wright, which puzzled mm -hmm. me because you ask the man on the street, the woman yes. on the street, Frank Lloyd Wright in America is the first person they say. Well, what happens, it turns out, is that Wright has a bunch of devotees and they're kind of a subculture in architecture but they're kind of apart from the main discourse of the time, mm. kind of like Husserlians. They have their own mm -hmm. huge sub-community, actually. Yes. And they've read everything, and they've read all these Nachlas manuscripts and stuff, so they know everything about him. What happened is that Frank Lloyd Wright was somewhat superseded for architects by, you know, Gropius and Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier. So modern architecture took another turn, and of course, in continental philosophy, Heidegger and Derrida and, and after that. But there's still a lot to be learned by going back and rereading mm -hmm. those with fresh eyes. Not necessarily anything to be learned from the orthodox explanations of those, right? Dan Zahavi, he's a smart guy. He's not somebody I learn a lot from, though, because he attacks speculative realism from a fairly orthodox Husserlian standpoint. He has mm. a, He's kind of defending a fairly orthodox Husserl, whereas he didn't respond to what's new in my Husserl in his, in his attack on Tom Sparrow's book. What's new in my Husserl is the idea that Every intentional object has two kinds of qualities. It's intention with its sensual qualities, intention with its real qualities. That was mentioned nowhere in Zahavi's response because I don't think he can account for it. Right. So there is an element of the real in Husserl, but it's not the objects that are real. It's the qualities that are real. Right. And real objects. So I would like to have more of that kind of debate with Husserlians instead of just getting sideswipes from them because we're not orthodox enough. Of course, we're not orthodox phenomenologists, but we know, I know my phenomenology and I have something to say about it. So I'd rather have a productive dialogue with them. I right. took my time with Husserl. And maybe the one thing that Maybe the resistance they have towards you is the resistance to trying to make excuses for the fact that he is interested in ideality and that yes. he has a specific brand of idealism. If they could accept that, then maybe they could have a, a conversation. But it does seem like mm -hmm. you point out their main goal is to defend him from anti-realism. It's like Hegelian saying, oh, but Hegel's an objective idealist. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. All right, fine. But it's he's still an idealist. He's still yes. saying the noumena is what thought thinks of the noumena. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's actually independent of thought. And then you get Zizek as being kind of a very, very talented propagandist for that outlook. <laughs> I, love, I love Zizek, by the way. He's one of my favorite people in the field, but we disagree on everything. I noticed in your writings that you do have, you can have respect for someone and disagree with them. Yeah. And that can be productive. But Graham, we kept you longer than than I I had hoped for. But time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Um, there were so many different things we could have talked about, but it was it's just one of those things where we like this to be enjoyable and not to have necessarily a, a bucket list, right? Uh, yeah. So so maybe maybe sometime in the fall, if you're willing to come back again, and we could talk about your 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 new works coming out on yeah. architecture and archaeology and the reader. Um, yeah, that'd be amazing. Graham Harmon reader. I'd love and, that. And the Graham Harden Reader, are you going to have some sports journalism in there? <laughs> Actually, no, I want to save that for one vial. I'm going to have a piece of journalism from Egypt, though, when I went to visit. That's nice. wonderful. The village, cool. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. We look forward to all of that. And again, I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this was this was uh, exciting, enlightening, and and very humorous. We had a lot of okay. laughter. There. You got us, you got okay. us laughing, and that's that's one of the that's one of the things that I think, uh, as you said, that's a good reason to to read and listen to philosophers is whether or not they make you laugh. Oh yeah, yeah. It'd be fun to start a genre of philosophy stand up comedy. Zizek sort of already does that. It'd be hard yes. to follow his shoes, but <laughs> it'd be a nice a nice genre to, to launch. All right, Grant. Well, we're going to let you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And as soon as this is edited and we're ready to, to put this out, I'll let you know. All and, right. Um, and we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. 
Oh, I'd love to. Thank you, guys. Thank you, this Graham. Thanks again, Graham. We love right. having you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Once again, thanks to Graham Harmon for joining us. And that will be this week's episode of the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins. The very rules of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. This is the typical violence of information. It's violence because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in the block work orange.